Well, good evening. Happy, happy Tuesday. It feels like Monday, Tuesday, January 16th of 2024. For someone who still feels like he's in 2022, learning to grasp with 2023, I am still getting used to that. But I like even numbers. It's a weird thing. It wouldn't be a true lawn lumber stream without me being a little bit late. But that's me. That's just me on time. I show up when I need to, when I can. And I'm always on time. Anyways, the thumbnail to this video previewed a conversation that I've been dying to have, and I know a lot of you have been as well. And it's a conversation with someone who, well, I'm concerned because the person I'm bringing on the screen tends to be a little long-winded in his questions and his uh, argument. And I see him behind the screen laughing already at his own self-deprecation or my jokes of him. But without further ado, Greg Anderson, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well, Rob. I'm so happy to be here. Finally, we pulled it together. I know. It's been a wild ride, but, uh, you know, today's a good day. And it turned out to be a very fortuitous day. To yes. This chat. Timing is impeccable. It's, I woke up to a series of text messages that all included the same thing. And it was the order that Judge Carroll entered. It came from, uh, I think, your lovely spouse. Uh, it came mm -hmm. from you. It came from Nick. And they all, they sent me the order immediately. Mm -hmm. I skimmed through it on my phone as I'm sure they were doing the same thing. And we were kind of all going, oh my God, what is it? What is it? What's going to happen? What a day. It really day indeed. was an amazing day. Jen had just brought me, she's my lovely wife brings me coffee in the morning, which is the only way they ever get me out of bed. <laughs> and, uh, and I had one sip and she said, there's an order and the first order we looked at was just as to the juror and, and to paul and we thought okay well we kind of know what he's going to say and i was about a third of the way through that she said there's a second order and it was like da, da, dun. and so we immediately jumped out of the first order and she read me the second one and we actually choked up both of us after the first page because we were, it was so emotional to read after all this time what the court was thinking about the case. We had, we had insight here and there with some very small comments, probably like during the, the questioning of juror number one, and I was going into my deal about why the amount of money was appropriate and that, that it was because the jurors were older and they understood for Jack what it would be like to not have a spouse anymore. And and the judge said, Mr. Anderson, he cut me off in two minutes and 34 seconds. They timed it. And he said, Mr. Man Anderson, I was in the courtroom with you, if you recall. <laughs> and that told me something like, okay, he doesn't need to be told. It about was the how, first three lines. Yeah. Pain more intense than childbirth. Pain oh, more. Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. Sounds. Pain. That's I mean, nice. that choked us up. We were like, "Golly, he really got it. He really got it." He did. And as I'm struggling to fix my microphone because I've got microphone issues, as the chat is telling me, because why would technology ever decide to work? But you need it. I don't know. I'm I'm not I'm not the only one who struggles with technology. I know that you have in prior cases. Oh, God. Constantly. Yeah. The gremlins so, are always after me. Always. Every time. So we're gonna we're gonna make do with what we have until we my Okay. I can't hear you. I'm not hearing you, Rob, if you can hear me or the folks can hear me, but. I don't know. It's picking up some, but I'm probably going to get some reverb. Reverb yeah. until this comes back. Everyone's saying, Elaine, Elaine, you don't know the story, but uh, there was a, a attorney in the Johnny Depp trial, Elaine, who would constantly speak while muted. It was very frustrating. That's lovely. Mm-hmm. Almost as lovely as technology not doing what you want it to do when you need to do it. <laughs> Give me one second. Sure. 
I don't know why you just didn't ask me a question and let me ramble on for about 15 minutes. Oh, I can do that. You want me to do that? I'll do that. Better, you know, strategy, I think. That I like the strategy. This is a good strategy because we can we can get you going for a little while. Uh, let me think about this. How can I get Greg Anderson to continue communicating while I do an emergency reboot of the computer? Let me think. Let me breathe. think. Breathe. <laughs> How much he loves his wife. <clears throat> oh, that is the perfect Lawrence, story. My, my <laughs> perfect, perfect, wonderful wife. Yes. Uh, exactly. I told you she was, has, brings me coffee. What more can you ask out of a lovely wife and bring you coffee in the morning? And, um, you know, and, and what I'm doing is I'm getting my, my gel refills for your incredible pens so I don't forget. Oh, you're ordering those on Amazon as we're talking? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I wanted to make I like sure I, I love I love my pen and I want it to be perfect. So I'm doing that right now. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to upload a slide. And Mischief Manager's in the chat, so she'll be able to keep it on screen. Uh, I think she should be able to move the actual pages of the order. <laughs> Greg, the chat is asking to see your pen. If you can move that towards the. Uh... Oh, yeah. Magnificent quality. Just a, a work of art by the incredible artisan lumber. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks, sir. Okay. I'm going to do this because my panic button is, well, my panic button. Um, Mischief, I've got to do a reboot. I'm pulling up that order. Now, okay. Mischief, can you hit the right, Mischief Manager, can you hit the right and left mouse button, see if you can't move that? Or if you hover over it, you should be able to click to the next slide. There you go. Greg. I'm going to do an emergency reboot. Would you mind giving a synopsis briefly? I'm trusting you, sir. <laughs> no. I'm trusting you. Jen, no, I'm trusting Jen. I'm trusting Jen. Jen, I'm trusting yes. you. As I restart, do not let him go too sideways. <laughs> Damn. If you, if you, oh, yeah. if, Can I tell the funny story of how he uh, came on to me? Absolutely. Well, maybe. I don't know. Is it PG? No, no, no. It's, it's very professional. Filthy, but... No, it's, it's very professional. That's how so I we were in, on a case together. and um... well, Hang on. Hang on. Don't start yet. Do that oh. chat. I'm going to reboot. I'll be right back. Okay. Yes. So we were on a case together and uh, working on it for a couple of years. And then one day he wrote me an email. And in the middle of the synopsis, he said, by the way, you looked really pretty in that dress. And I was so offended by him saying that. Because that she looked I was, nice. Because I was a professional. I brought it, I printed it out, brought it to my boss at the time and said, what is this guy thinking talking about how I look? And um, yeah, that's how it all started. <laughs> she was horrified, but I was persistent. Yes. I was very, very persistent and eventually won her over. It only took like, you know, six months of wooing. I did a lot of wooing. I think it was more like five years, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still wooing a little bit. Yeah. So what is this order? Um, besides making me cry and Jen cry when we first read it this morning, I would say that this is a judge who is very much aware just what a big deal this and i'm looking for my copy of it while we're doing this uh you, can you pull uh, that up for me yeah, honey here. uh so here, honey. i think he's aware of just how big a deal this case is and how many this people one. are following it and it's with without a doubt he spent he, he he used all of the time since he said he would get it to us by the 22nd i think he said 21st or 22nd so he's <laughs> He's he's early by a week, and that doesn't surprise me with him, the fact that he's early. 
but he must have used every minute he had since he announced that working on this thing because it really is a work of art. I don't know how you put together 17 pages. Well, I do know how much work it takes, but for a judge to put this together and make sure that all of the facts are absolutely perfect because he knows this is likely going to go up on appeal and he knows there's going to be a lot of people within the legal community analyzing this order. And a lot of people don't know it, but in Florida, you, you can get published and I forget whether the judge chooses it or how they're chosen, but certain orders on summary judgment and JNOV directed verdict are, are published in Florida in the, from the circuit court and it's called the Florida supplement. And uh, it may have gone out of fashion now. Maybe it's up on Westlaw or, or Lexus. You know, if it's on Lexus, Jen was a Lexus rep in, in uh, law school. So she knows a lot of that stuff, but um, he knows that this might end up being published and um, good if it does, because he did a fine job. Um, you know, I don't like losing the money out of it because we're down from 261 to, I think it's varying reports of 216 to 224, but it's still twice as much as we ever expected we would recover. I really thought the case would come in somewhere. I, I thought it would either go one or two ways. Either I didn't think they would reject us, but I thought either they'd pick and choose certain causes of action. They just didn't buy our case at all. Uh, they would still go with some of the intentional acts, some of those things. And it would be, but it would be like a four or $5 million case. Or if the case went in, well, I thought it would be somewhere between 50 and 75,000. I thought 100,000 would be knocking it out of the park. 100,000? 100 million. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Not 100,000. 100 million would be knocking it out of the park. So even after the court uh, reduced it, obviously we're still very pleased. The Kowalskis are very pleased. And um, it just showed a, a lot of, and I don't want to say emotion, but it showed a lot of caring on the part of this judge. And I didn't know that he had kids around the same age as I have kids, at least the second batch. And, um, but I think being, being a father and a husband, I think he really understood uh, the gravity. Yeah, the gravity of things and what the Kowalskis were really telling him and telling that jury. And that well, was and, and pleasing to me. Hopefully, the microphone is a little bit better now. It's good. Good. Because that was kind of where I wanted to start with this. I have seen a lot of orders in my time. I've never seen an order like this where it's, it's, and I thought it was a typo at first when I read the beginning of the order. I thought mm -hmm. we would see, you know, this comes before the court on these post-trial motions. Uh, this is the court's ruling. But no, Judge Carroll decided he's going to begin it this way. Order on post-trial uh, motions. Pain more intense than childbirth. Pain more intense than kidney stones. Pain more intense than amputating one's limb. The worst pain imaginable. The degree and intensity which most of us cannot comprehend. Pain so intolerable that the condition is nicknamed the, quote, suicide disease, end quote. This was but a small portion of the evidence presented to the jury concerning the pain associated with a condition called CRPS. Mm. Right from the bat, you knew he was not playing around. Mm -hmm. yep. And immediately when he makes this comment, small portion of the evidence presented to the jury, but he recites it because this is now the jury's finding. Yep. So he backs that finding, which also tells you I'm not deviating very much. I might take a look at the numbers, but I'm not going very far to deviate from that. Yep. Loud and, and clear. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and then the last paragraph in his opening page, there can be no question the jury credited Maya Kowalski's version of evidence, and the jury rejected Jay Hatch's claims that it provided Maya with exceptional, compassionate, and heroic care. To further emphasize the point, the jury rejected 
Jay Hatch's belief that it was Maya's savior. He capitalized the savior just to move, make a point even further. That was an interesting opening. Yeah. But I think my favorite part came right about where was it? And I think I screen grabbed it. And I even might have texted this because it related to the battery findings. Now, I, I was curious what Judge Carroll was going to do with the mm -hmm. remitter and how he was going to analyze the post-trial motions. I thought he was going to be very even-handed mm -hmm. and respectful of the arguments made. But I thought he was going to side with Maya's plaintiff's case because the plaintiffs won a jury. And the one thing judges hate doing is they hate disrupting jury outcomes. It's the most fair system that we have. It's the most fair thing we can, we can create. Yep. So when it came to this, this spoke volumes to me. As it relates to the battery findings for the hugs, kisses, and petting, no means no. Yeah. No means no. The court, no though, pauses to note a paragraph at page 81 of the motion. And Jay Hatch says, Maya Kowalski's claims that Ms. Beattie told her she wanted to be her mother, assuming the testimony is true, and Ms. Beattie's testimony is false. That statement is not a battery, and it did not involve a touching. It would have to rise to the level of extreme emotional distress, even to be relevant in the case. What a very appropriately chosen paragraph. Yeah. Because then the judge goes on. This, of course, minimizes the testimony, which speaks of the intentional infliction of emotional distress. Yet J. Hatch discusses it in the context of battery, saying the statement is not a battery as if to dismiss the conduct in its entirety. I will pull that down momentarily. Every trial attorney creates a theme. And it's one of the things that they don't really teach in law school, but your case doesn't have, you cannot create a narrative unless you create a theme. And your theme, I wondered what it was from the beginning, but it really started to solidify and became more granite towards the end when you kept repeating a certain phrase. They just don't get it. They just don't uh -huh. get it. Uh-huh. Interesting how he, without saying it, said it in his order. Oh, yeah. Don't you think? I, I loved it because he highlights so much in this order how many of the things are cherry-picked in the motions. And you expect that from attorneys. You expect them to cherry-pick the things that are favorable to their point. But the way that they tried to argue the cherry-picked language was kind of how they tried to argue the whole case. Mm -hmm. And it really did. I mean, one of the most impactful things in this trial, and, and honestly, for the post-trial motions, was your repetition of that phrase. I believe that to be true, 100%. When you kept repeating that phrase towards the end, they just don't get it, and kept on repeating it, you are finding that phrase more, more differently articulated in various orders rehashing that over and over again with every single order the jury examination they just don't get it the dismissal of the janovs the judgment notwithstanding the verdict they just don't get it all of it yeah so yeah now he did grant remitter in one area that was not the conceded area i believe and it was a total of what 34.5 million that he he remitted down right. right and it was with regard to jacks the big one was with regard to jacks um the 50 million the 50 million and it in that context he kind of cites back to what was argued was uh when he asked alton burn how am i supposed to do it am i supposed to pick number from the hat what do i do i can't calculate it what do i do right and Judge Alton, or our former, I guess, retired Judge Alton Byrne said, yeah, pick it from a hat. So he 
did that. He right. goes, sure, you got it. I'll bring it more in line with Maya and Jack's damages. There you go. Uh, yeah. That's what he did. What did it feel like this morning reading that? One, were you on pins and needles when you got it? It was more me reading it to yeah. him. Yeah, she <laughs> read it to me. Jen read it to me. And it wasn't on, we weren't on pins and needles very long because the from the first sentence, we knew he is just going to let them have it. I never doubted that he was going to remit something because of course we conceded the, the 5 million on the fraud. And of course, then there was 2.5 and set off, which how he still hasn't stipulated to, although why he wouldn't do that other than to delay the judgment, I don't know. But from the first time, from the first paragraph, really, again, it just kept going through my mind. He gets it. He understands as a dad, as a husband, as a jurist, and as a human being, what was being said in that courtroom and just how horrific from Jack and Beata's point of view as parents, knowing what was happening to Maya and not being able to respond and not being able to do anything about it, to have the forces of government combined with a huge corporation aligned against you and feeling completely and utterly powerless. Judge Carroll, I think, really understood that. And I think that in combination with the way they treated him the last few days, which was just oh, intolerable God. and embarrassing for the profession, they didn't do themselves any favors there. But I knew from the first paragraph, and I wasn't really on pins and needles. It was almost like we wanted to turn to the end and say, okay, well, he hit, it for, hit us for 25, or he hit us for 30, or he, you know, we just wanted to see that. And then we come back in our leisure and read the rest of it, which is what Nick did, by the way. And he called us and told us how much got knocked off before we even got halfway through the order. <laughs> so uh, I, I was, when I heard the order, of course, I had that first sinking feeling in my stomach like oh my god this is like my whole life here mm -hmm. what's gonna happen what happens if he doesn't buy it you know what happens if he thinks it's all a crock and that just Maya was lying all everybody was lying and I didn't think in any way I I, I, I put that as a less than 10 percent chance less than five percent chance but it's possible oh and you wonder when you see the order come across you wonder real quick all, your mind calculates faster than you could possibly imagine. And you go through all the scenarios and you you think about all your life choices over the past several five years. And it, it you feel like it comes down to this. Yeah. Now, you know, I mean, a, a couple of one one chat I wanted to pull up here. Rob, ask open ended questions so you don't get yes or no answers, please. Don't worry. Don't worry, Greg. Greg <laughs> won't need. He, 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 he. We're laughing. We're laughing because one of the one of the things that, that is an unspoken unspoken truth is I will get a phone call from Greg Anderson, which who has become a very lovely friend uh, in the time since covering this trial. I will get a phone call from Greg Anderson. Hey, Rob. Real quick thought. Forty five minutes later. <laughs> <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> and I I oh, teased no. you earlier. I teased you earlier. The text messages, my friend. I don't know how your thumbs still exist because paragraphs. And I know that there is talk to text, but sir, you you text message like you ask like you ask questions when you don't have a place to go. <laughs> Well, I just, I find it, you know, I enjoy talking to you. So I just come up with random Rob, stuff. imagine being married to him. <laughs> so, honey, I was just out grabbing a, 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 a carton of milk. And then 45 minutes later, honey, have you picked up, have you picked up the milk yet? Oh, no, I'm still standing in front of it. 
<laughs> but now you know all about how our car's color changes as we as you drive through them. Oh God, I love it. I love it. And there was times during this trial, and the judge addresses some of it in he uh, right here. He does. He goes the addition of time. Yes, sir. The addition of time. Why are we talking about the addition of time at the end of trial? Because a certain attorney drove me nuts. <laughs> the entire time. You and a half, about half of the people out there, actually about 90% of the people out there, as I see now, I just didn't want you guys to get bored. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Now, I, of course, I told you I have my little birdies out there, my little birdies who are... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. communicating with me and one of them said they should have created a drinking game throughout the trial uh, <laughs> and the drinking the drinking game would have been um if so the drinking game would have been during trial if greg begins a question with in so far as <laughs> followed by an unintelligible three paragraph question that he ultimately withdraws when the judge looks at him questioning I don't think a single soul would be able to drive after that game. <laughs> In so far as, oh, oh my God, the, the, the stress, <laughs> the stress that you that you caused to this litigator who was watching and covering, and to your wife, a litigator who was watching must have been just beyond oh do you want to hear my excuse about this question yes i would love to no why i do that i am unbelievably but true capable of asking a simple direct question and if you saw my crosses well anyway see i already did it no i saw i did yeah um but most of those were to people who were had never been in the courtroom before or if they had it was very brief and they were very uncomfortable up there no matter how well they appeared to come off and i always feel with those kind of witnesses that if your questions are too precise mm -hmm. you're not going to give them the full context in your question of what you want so you end up asking a whole lot of little questions and maybe that is more effective but it's more stressful on the witnesses and if you asked any one of the witnesses the lay witnesses now not so much the experts about how they felt up there most of them that we talked to said well after greg got finished with his fourth unintelligible long-winded question i decided i just needed to take it over and and get my points across <laughs> I got that. Like, I get it's. I get where you're going. Let me give you the answer that I think you want. Exactly. You know. You know, Greg. I use a trick for that, and it's usually this, and it preserves the record. It usually is. I'm going to navigate to a different topic. I'm going to preface this question with a signpost to to tell you where I'm going, and that doesn't get objected to. Or if it does, I kind of just say I'm laying a, I'm laying foundation, Judge. He, he can't answer the question if I don't give him the predicate to the question. But insofar as, I guess works, insofar yeah. as, in so far as, as getting the witness to the question, I guess it works. So speaking of those crosses, I had another, another thought that was uh, one that I echoed throughout the trial. And I know that you had heard back reports of some of my commentary. <laughs> oh, yeah. From me. One. How oh, no. was that in the middle of trial to learn back commentary from another lawyer that you have no clue of? Go, this guy is questioning what I'm doing. Is it weird? Uh, it, it is weird. I hadn't had it happen too much before. I'd never been on any of the law tube shows. I'd had things critiqued, but it was in a different context by non lawyers. Usually when I got interviewed by media after the Coltis trial or things like that, you know, they're pretty much, they're, I don't mean to say clueless, but they're not asking the type of pointed, oh, maybe I should have thought about that type questions like like you did. And so. Um, I would usually review. Yeah. And, and, and it. Actually, they helped, believe it or not, some of them helped. 
the ones that I thought, guy, maybe I need to brush up on that helped. But a lot of times what you were telling me in the questions was what I wanted to do was was effective for where I wanted to go. Like, God, mm-hmm. your question is long-winded. Well, yeah, I kind of want some of those to be long-winded. I kind of want the, it's like with the jury, you need to stay two or three steps back emotionally from yep. them and let them lead you to the verdict. You don't ram it down their throats. Mm-hmm. You want to get this kind of award. With lay you witness, have to, you have to bait them into it. You have to make them want the answer to the question that you have not yet asked. You have to you have to leave the inquiry hanging there for a second and see that they're picking up on the direction you're going and recognize that the person on the stand is just not answering the question that you really want them to answer. Yeah. Plus we have general questions. Yeah, I know. And that was, that was a, a very fun thing to observe. Um, great. One thing in, in so far as, in so far as the commentary, (laughs) (laughs) in so far as the commentary of certain commentators, uh, that might have impacted or resonated with you. One of those, comments that I think might have impacted was I started to throughout the course of the trial during the beginning. And as you started moving into um, the defendant's case in chief, you were still cross-examining every single witness direct and cross by you hundred percent of the time. And I made several comments going, sir, you have other counsel at the table. You cannot do this. 100%. And if you keep trying, you're going to hit a wall. And, and I f- feel like that resonated. And you and I have had a chat about this before. And I don't think the, the the chat at large or people at large know about this. But I that wall hit with a particular witness. Oh, yeah. More than the more. Which witness was that, Greg? Oh, I forgot. I don't know who that could possibly uh-huh. be. And what did your wife tell you? Greg, you need to slow down. Stop over prepping. Stop trying to do everything yourself mm-hmm. um, and just be you and let Nick take some of the load. I think you said that to me 4,278 times. And then Bob probably said it about 30. Very times. accurate number. Very accurate number. Yeah, probably. And what is the one cross examination you with you had? We wish you had back. Uh, baby. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, I know. Man. I was, I, I have lived, you know, they say there's three trials. You know this. There's three trials. There's the one you plan. There's the one you actually do. And there's a perfect one you run through in your head a million times afterwards, reliving all of the horrible mistakes and things you could have done different or more effective. And I will live with uh, the, the, the Beatty lack of cross-examination for the rest of my career and uh all my friends don't worry they remember every single one of these my friends still remember from the time i double false started at acc finals in an event uh dqing myself and how long has that been that's like you know 45 years ago what was the uh what did you run huh what did you run and i swam and okay i went down to swim the 50 i it's a long story, but all of mine are. But anyway, I was a 200 and 500 and sometimes 100 in high school. And that's where I was an All-American. And then at, at Duke, nobody could swim the 1650 or the 1000. So I moved up to swim distance. And then my senior year, uh, I, I moved down to try to swim the 50, probably because I got so fat. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I managed to double fault start one event and my, my friends to the, you know, I, I died a thousand deaths. You just don't do that. It never happened in my career before. And, um, and my friends still to this day will remind me of that. So I will be living with, with the Kathy Beatty Lacco cross for the rest of my career, probably the rest of my life, courtesy of all my buddies. And my wife and you, but it also, it also caused you to do one of the smartest things that you did, which was to employ very tactfully co-counsel Nick Whitney, who I think 
I think he kind of made his bones during this trial. He did right. very well. I know he was a younger attorney when you when you took him under, but by doing that, by allowing him to share some of the burden on cross, I want to share his thoughts in his words. His takedown of Witness Anderson was legendary in exposing that Witness Anderson was operating solely off of a two or three page outline provided Shapiro by Shapiro the night before. He demonstrated in about 10 minutes that Witness Anderson was, well, Witness Anderson, I'm paraphrasing, had a motivation and had no idea about what really went on. You, I, I am firmly of the belief that you could not have done that cross had you continued on the pace that you had. And by sharing that load, that opened up your capacity to give one of the cross examinations that your colleague, Nick Whitney views as one of the most significant crosses he's ever witnessed. No, that's nice of Nick. Uh, that's all true. And I'm used to Uh, as unbelievable as it is nowadays, when I started trying cases in the 80s, I never had any support except for my legal assistant, and she would be wrangling witnesses to get them down there. And granted, they weren't particularly complex cases. They were slip and falls and trip and falls and, and lemon law cases, and but they were jury trials. And it wasn't until I had tried probably 40 50 trials before I started to get any help. So I was used to doing everything, all the legal argument, all the briefing, all the board are opening, closing, direct cross of every witness. And so I'm just, I'm just used to doing everything myself. And in a case this big, I knew I was going to, I wanted to believe I was Superman. I proved to the entire world. I'm not. I also felt that, having this is a little vanity but i felt that having nick watch me do it for as long as i did he got uh it got him very nick's competitive and he got oh, yeah. competitive juices flowing in him and they got his confidence up and it got him in that state of mind mm -hmm. you know it's a hard you know this it's a hard transition from a normal human being into cross-examining another person on that stand in front of a bunch of people with the sole purpose of making that person look like an idiot. You, you cannot go in there as Casper milk toast. You have got yeah. to be aggressive and you've got to take them down. And I felt as though if Nick watched me for a while, although he, he, he'd done two trials with me before uh, and one on his own, but I felt as though, if he watched long enough, kind of the, let me get in there, coach, that kind of feeling, I thought he would be even more effective than he would have been if I just like interspersed him here and there throughout. So even there, I did have a strategy. I just played it too long. And your reminder, your comment on that very much helped because you reiterated what Jen was saying. And, um, and that caused me to say, you know, hmm, I just wish I had realized it before Beatty and started to give him stuff about four or five days before, because then I would have just eaten her lunch. I felt like when I came back after the witnesses, I thought the, the jury saved me to a certain extent because they asked, particularly Paul, asked a lot of very cogent questions and got me sort of back on track. They, they, well, and to your earlier point, they saw you where you were going with it. They had seen your style enough. Mm -hmm. And, and that was the other part I wanted to make because every lawyer has their own style. Greg has his style. It's, it's, it is trial a la Greg. Every single right. lawyer has their own trials, tr trial style. Right. And you got to see Nick Whitney kind of develop and fall into his own. He yep. wasn't going to be the Greg Anderson. He wasn't going to be that, but what you did was a very different tactic, but it also, that foundation led to the jury picking up where you left off with Kathy Beatty. So they're very different styles. Some people tend to one, others tend to the other. Um, and honestly, when you mix them up like that, that's even better. That becomes, you don't know what you're going to get. Are you going to get the fast 
uh, aggressive cross, or are you going to get the uh, longer cross that lulls the witness and gets them to evade questions long enough that you start hammering them? Yeah. You never know. No, you know, um, one of the things that I, and Jen tells me this in, in the trials that she knows when I'm doing well, is that, is that, um, you know, a lot of stuff in trial is boring for the jury and it's, it's, uh, Jen tells me that she's watching the jury and then after it's the direct examination of whoever's on the other side and I start to get out of my chair, you see the jury kind of shift and, and, and lean forward, like this is going to be good. And, and if you're, and if you're good and, and you're doing it right, that's, that's what you, that you, you want that. You want to see the reaction of the jury of, Oh boy, I want to see some fireworks. Do something fun, Greg. <laughs> judges do too. I mean, yeah, this is a Greg show. Do something. Yeah, I tell. I mean, I tell clients when I'm prepping them to testify. I said, what I want the judge to see is a back and forth. I want every yeah. good trial lawyer wants the judge or jury to be in a tennis match where they're doing this. Boom, boom, back boom, and forth, boom. back and forth, back right. and forth. They want to hear what comes out of your mouth just as much as they want to hear what comes out of the witness's mouth. Like, right. boom, boom, boom. Where are we going? And no question. I had a question about this one because there's there's got to be a, almost, I don't mean to say like proud dad moment, but proud uh, proud mentor moment. And it was, I think it was Nick Whitney's cross of, who was the uh, expert who had the pink background? I forget. Um, oh. The yeah. psychologist, was it? Or... Uh, no, she. It was the pink. Remember, she had the pink background. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She was. It was a that. The, uh, or yeah, it was some kind of therapist. Yeah. It was a. It was a. It wasn't. Oh, I felt a, bad for her. Liability for yeah. He oh, her. but you, you just you watch Nick find his his rhythm, and every lawyer has their own right. And when he did that last one, which was what I said was throwing the grenade over top of you, and he said he left the podium before she answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> There had to be, I imagine in my, in my chest, there was just this beaming pride that you felt like, oh, okay, there it is. There's the artfulness. He gets it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he gets it. It clicked. Oh. And it really happens. You know, this, it happens in your career where certain things that you've been trying and trying and trying to do, and then it could be anywhere, anytime, anyhow, you keep doing it. And it'll suddenly click for you. And it's like, yep, it was oh, that's how you do it. You know? And and most, well, the problem I see now is that, and I think this is true of the defense, um, whatever accolades Howie had had before, none of them struck me as people who had tried enough cases where that, all of it that needed to click had clicked for them. Certainly not with Nathan, oh, uh, David, forget it. Uh, David Hughes, forget it. Even Howard, watching him, I don't know. They were, well, they, they, they were people. Well, the they, jury, they, they, the same thing, you know, they, they were not approachable at all. No. And they fed into the narrative. That's the biggest problem. When <laughs> they played the bad guy beautifully. But when you're, you're crafting a narrative at the beginning of the trial. And, and this was something I learned a long time ago, just the narrative aspect. You have to have a theme. And the theme has to be so good that the other side just doesn't get it. They, they can't possibly ever beat you in court because they don't even understand the theme that you're attacking. And they can't mm -hmm. pivot to defend it. And they fed into that. Excellent choice of words. They can't pivot. And so many trials now, and I don't try that many as I used to, but, you know, maybe a couple of year now. And any lawyer that comes in and tells you, oh, I, you know, I tried five major trials this year. <laughs> no, you didn't. Because what kind of trial are you trying if you can put together five major trials in one year? I want to see that done. But anyway, um, you... You have to, um, you got to read the jury and you got to know when you're losing them. And I see so many lawyers now that have their questions written out 
and then literally the answers written out. Uh -huh. And I've seen I it have that. where they've got, or they're opening and closing, that's the worst, but where they've got question, uh, the, the, the General Electric trial lawyers in the Coltis case, 144, um, Kevin Smith, oh boy, did the jury have fun with that. Mr. Anderson, Mr. Smith, you know, the Matrix was going on back then. Anyway, uh, but he had his questions written out in the, the paralegal would hand him a book when the witness went up and he'd open the book. We didn't have the witness's name and you know, probably scrolling and, you know, <laughs> and embossing on it. And, uh, you know, and I had like three scraps of paper I dug out of my pocket and, um, and then it would be the question. And then there would be, he had the green answer, the yellow answer and the red answer. So it was oh, expected you're kidding. Yeah. No. And there were so many times and he wasn't the only one. I'm not just picking on him when the, the witness would give him by an answer, particularly my own witnesses, Are you talking about would, Smith? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my own witnesses would, would, would answer the question. I would just be cringing inside. Like, please don't, please don't follow up. Please don't follow up. Please don't follow up. And he wouldn't because he wasn't actually listening to what the person yep. was, the witness was saying. He was just checking things off, you know? I knew immediately you were talking about Smith. Sorry. <laughs> and what's 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 really funny is that echoes one of the first experiences that I ever had that made kind of convinced me to be a trial attorney was I I've told you this. So you and I share an alumnus, Nova Southeastern University. That's right. NSU law. And we're little guys with chips on our shoulders. Well, no, we're not little guys. Let me let me caveat I that know. for a real quick, real quick sidetrack. We are not little guys. To give you an example of the fact that we're not little guys, I am six feet tall in this photo. I am six feet tall. That is Greg <laughs> Anderson and Nick Whitney. I am a six foot tall man. These are giants. <laughs> I think I felt I'm like six two, a little over six two, and Nick's like got two inches, three inches like me. And my dad's six five. Yeah, the kids are gonna be huge. No, you're a big it's guy. Just, you're a big guy, and it it is it can be disconcerting, but you have uh, why why I mean, I mean it, what I was saying is never been your problem. The the NSU law and the chip on your shoulder. So I got thrown into trial practice very very young as an attorney. First year, first week, I had a trial. Excellent. Scary. I love Shouldn't it. have happened, but scary, and I gave my first opening statement and it was scripted and my law partner who's a very dear friend of mine um she was watching in the gallery and after the trial i said i need notes she goes never ever ever write your opening statement again ever never script it out and from then on i never did and this came back 12 years later in an argument that was being relayed by an attorney on the other side in a closing and she had a scripted closing the problem was her scripted closing cited evidence that I had gotten blocked. So in the middle of her closing, I had to object because she was referring to evidence that the court had stricken. And it was one of those. And the second I made that objection, uh, didn't pass, she was didn't pass so evidence. thrown off, so thrown off. She could not find her place. She couldn't finish her close. Yep. And once that, what's it? Once she stopped and she started thinking about what she was doing rather than doing it, she froze, I bet. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible feeling, isn't it? <sighs> well, you know, you and, and, and for your viewers, I mean, it doesn't take experienced trial attorneys very long talking to another, quote, trial attorney to figure out, as I keep saying, whether they get it or not, whether they really know what they're doing. Rob, you know what you're doing. And I could tell that pretty much from your comments during the trial. I hadn't met you. I hadn't really, you know, but I, the points you were making, I said, okay, this guy, he, he's a pro. He knows what's going on. He, he's pointing out stuff that's been circulating in the back of my mind, but I haven't really got it out there yet. So you never had to write out your stuff after that. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure I, I never, you and I did what you do. 
I, I never have. And and thank you for the very kind remarks. What I only the only thought I have is when you're making those kind of remarks about the things that were circulating in the back of your brain that I was saying out loud, I'm 95% sure that your wife was also saying those things out loud to you. And the second that you decided, the second you decided, maybe I shouldn't do all the crosses, she probably said, You think? How many times have I said that? <laughs> oh yeah, she's not she's not one for mincing words. Let me tell you that. She'll let me know exactly how she thinks I'm doing and when I'm going. No, Jen's tremendously supportive, but she does not mince words. That is not that's not her. And and she was too. Why don't you listen to that guy from TV? <laughs> <laughs> You're probably going, are you kidding? What? What are you on right now? I'm in the middle of trial. What am I supposed? I can't do that. What is this person going to do? It was so pathetic. By the end, I was actually watching you, and you're the only one I really knew that that mattered to me. I, I kind of shuffled through a few of them, and and Megan, I love you, and I and, and the, the other folks, and I did watch their shows a little bit. But but I, you're the only, one, and this is actually a true fact. And Jen can back me up on this. You're the only one that, if I had some spare time at the end of the evening, I would actually watch a little bit to see what your views were and i always did it with trepidation like man i wonder if i fucked up something today <laughs> seriously that that means a lot coming from you thank you no i did you were the only one um and um you know there's a great people on on the different shows but you were the only one that i thought like i said that got it and was providing me stuff that was worth my time if i you know most of the time i was just so freaking exhausted that I'd finish work and crash and be out in five minutes. But if I, I did have tell you what to watch. Yeah. yeah. And Jen also was a big advocate of yours. And um, you'll never guess what Rob told me today. It's exactly what I've been thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was from the very outset, it was a tough case because it balanced this weird area of law and plaintiff's counsel I mean, I can imagine when you jumped in this case, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but when you jumped in this case, you're probably going, this is an area of law that is so nuanced. How I, I feel like I should get this in front of a judge, but how do I navigate all these hurdles with the immunity and chapter 39 and DCF and all the above? And that was the area that kind of brought attention to me was explaining that nuance to other people going, this is what the law allows. These are the protections that are there. And this fits in this really weird fine line of dancing argument where you have to be careful because the judge is going to call you back mm. or you're going to get a mistrial. And I was, I was very impressed with how you guys navigated that. And I made my criticisms when you tried to go outside those bounds but then the defense made my argument for me when they just decided they wanted to bring all that back in. I was like, wait a minute, hold on. I thought you fought to exclude all that stuff. Yeah. Sword and shield much. Yeah. Just a bit. I, well, I, okay. So I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit. You know, I, um, judge Carroll, I'm just definitely not judge Carroll's kind of guy. And my Ooh. style is completely antithetical to his whole approach. <laughs> by i mean we're just polar opposites in personality and everything else and i'm convinced he thought i was just a huge joke for the first two years or more i was appearing before him and i don't think it was until about halfway through this trial maybe a third of the way through this trial that he, he he took a couple steps back and said um you know, maybe this guy does know a little bit about what he's doing. Maybe I won't take everything he says as personally insulting. Maybe I'll actually listen to him more than two minutes and thirty-four seconds. Was uh, that, did you time? Did you time that, Greg? Was that yeah. timed? Yeah, it was. I tell you exactly. Was, it, was, was that a, was that a really bad day? No, that was an average time. Um, well, no, maybe I'll tell you where it was. It was when I started at the arguments on remember i took over from elegate on part of the motion for new trial arguments yeah and i came up and argued on the remitter part of it a little bit and that's where 
he broke in and said, Mr. Anderson, you know, I was in the courtroom too. And that was at two minutes and 34 seconds into my argument, which actually <laughs> was about a minute more than he usually gave me. <laughs> and Jed's got a, a down perfect. His, his, if you go back and watch, when I start arguing, he, his face shows, how would you put it, Jen? I, I imagine it's, it's, it's where are you going with this? Yeah. Here we go. Well, not only that, but it's like physical discomfort yes. of That's listening good, to me. Yeah. His, his, he's grinding his teeth. He's moving his jaw. It's like it's physically uh, harming him to even listen to me. <laughs> so it's just it's a really so bad true. way. But, I mean, he, but he did, he but did, say, he did listen. I have a lot of stuff I was saying about like sword and shield. If you read the yeah, order, I, mean, a lot of stuff I was saying through the whole trial. And I'm going to let Jen chime in here. Cause I made the point several times. I think he appeal proof the case. And I, I made that point pretty emphatically when he made his rulings, you guys would hate some of them, but I was like, Oh no, that was smart. Or on the other side, they despise it. I was like, oh, he, baby, he, he's bringing the house down. Um, it, it was very frustrating, but Greg and I would talk at night. And I'm like, you know what? He's limiting. Wait, hang on, hang on, Jen, one sec. Keep talking. I'm going to go off screen for two seconds. Keep talking. Don't panic. Uh, no, he was limiting the appellate uh, issues. And for mm -hmm. that, I was very grateful. Um, it yeah, was frustrating. And so was I. <laughs> We, we got it towards the end. We understood what he was doing. And I know from experience that if an experienced trial judge can pretty much pick within, I don't know, the first quarter of the trial, who's going to win. And they're not perfect, but they've got a pretty good idea of who's going to prevail because they listen to the openings. They're watching the jury. They're getting impressions and they've heard it a thousand times and they're completely, you know, in the middle. They don't a good judge to care in the sense of once well, just justice done. And so with, um, with a judge who starts to rule against you on everything except mm -hmm. the big, big issues, mm -hmm. that's a big message. That is, I'm pretty sure you're going to win. I know these rulings really aren't going to make much difference with the jury. Yeah, I'm going to exclude that. Yeah, I'm going to exclude that. But you got them already. You know, kind of like stop beating your head against the wall. You got this jury. I'm going to continue to rule against you on all these little things. And I'm yep. doing you a favor, sport. I'm taking away that issue and that issue and that issue and that issue. Because um, if you talk to these guys, and I, I had the long before I met Jen, but um, I had the uh privilege of dating a circuit court judge who uh at first i worked for her then um uh we went out a little while when she was a circuit court judge and then she became a dca judge and uh i think she'll end up on the supremes but she would she would tell me about the judges conferences and the judges conferences they would emphasize this idea of don't waste the taxpayers money yep. don't set these cases up for appeal they're going to, especially the defense, is going to try to throw in a bunch of stuff to set it up. We don't want these cases going up on appeal unless they need to go on appeal. So all of these trial judges get it drilled into them. Don't waste the taxpayer's money. We don't have the time and we don't have the money to just take every single thing up on appeal. So do us all a gigantic favor and, and appellate proof these things as much as you can. Some are better than others, but Judge Carroll is pretty damn good. Well, and that brings me to an interesting point on, so we, we shared a dinner after the verdict and at that dinner, we had an exchange and Nick Whitney was present, you, me and Nick, and we were chatting about this and I was laughing about the evidence of that, uh, Jay Hatch's, the interim CEO, the person they brought in to run it and the video that oh was, God. <gasps> that guy. And I, I was laughing and I'm laughing. But I couldn't believe he tried to get it in. And Nick looks over at me deadpan and goes, well, what do you mean? It should have come in. And I could not stop laughing. <laughs> I was, I'm going, oh, my God, are you what are you talking about? Why couldn't it come in? If you want you want to invite 
any question on the punitives. You let that in. That was a no brainer. He says, but it could have been relevant. It was all these other things. I said, I don't care. <laughs> it's not coming in. There was no chance. And I was laughing my ass off and you started laughing too. And, and seeing Nick reach that point, like a little little bit over and over, just going, you knew it was never coming in. Right. And he goes, no, I thought it was coming in. Come on, buddy. (laughs) Come on, man. I remember that. Like I remember looking at him like, are you serious? Come on. Yeah. It was a good shot. It was, it was worth the shot, but why? I mean, but every now and then he got it. What was great about yeah. it is the judge saw it and the look on his face while that thing was yeah. playing was priceless. He's like, these people are freaking. He had that look on his face of these people are freaking idiots. <laughs> what do I have in front of me? He had that look. I don't think I don't know. He's thinking that, but that's the look he had on his face. Well, <laughs> and 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 the other thing was that was so funny was you got to see some of the character of Judge Hunter. Uh, or Hunter Carroll at the end when um, after that, when the uh, the open mic night or the the forum, the discussions that were being had and um, what was it? Howard Hunter gets up and makes the comment like, I haven't seen these videos. And Carol looks at him just kind of like over his glasses after watching that debacle of a video that didn't get ent- introduced and goes, you mean to tell me that you haven't, these are videos that are purportedly created by your client like they're they're yours i'm you you want me to you want me to buy that like saw that some of this stuff was just out of control stupid and i'm so happy that the court finally saw what i had to deal with we had to deal with for five years and when we file our motion for attorney fees. I'm going to let it all out. I'm going to tell you everything that went on in this case, clips from depositions, stuff that if your audience saw it, they could not believe that people would act like that, that lawyers would actually do some of the stuff that, for instance, David Hughes did. I mean, that thing with Maya in the bikini. Well, that was- let me let me get let me get to that second. Let me get a few questions, and we'll get to that. I'll bring you right back to that. I promise. Sure. Um, Laura Bronson asks, "When will interest start accruing?" Good question. Um, okay, so Nick and I had this discussion earlier, and we are of two minds. I am old school, and he is probably more right. The interest typically starts running from the date that the judgment is entered. However. Typically. Typically, Typically. yes. In commercial cases where the the, the law is that when the sum is liquidated as to a specific amount, as a specific date in time, then you can get prejudgment interest on it. So like um, a medical bill, something Mm -hmm. like that, where you know, I incurred this medical bill for $100 on July 5th. Purely compensatory, the, the amount is set. Yeah, it's a it's a special damage, and and you in the amount of set you can get prejudgment interest on that. Where we're differing is after the ver- between the time of the verdict and the time of the judgment. If by its verdict, I know that there's law out there that if by its verdict the jury sets a date and time for the incurrence of the damage, which may be the date of the verdict itself, then you can get interest, post-verdict, pre-judgment interest, where I am not positive about by any means is whether A, that law is still good, B, whether that only applies again to specific sums, liquidated sums, medical bills, out of pocket expenses, um, stuff like that, or whether that also applies if the jury fixes the date, which is the date of the verdict of a general damage. If it is, then they owe us an extra million dollars. My, so- my question, like just hypothecating this one going forward, my question would be let's say that that argument that i would anticipate that some wasn't fixed because it was still at risk because there was still a motion for remitted or pending 
So the sum was at risk. But then there's the contrary argument where you run the risk by filing the motion for remitter that that's not going to be granted. And running that risk by filing that motion may have a retroactive effect in that the, if you lose your motion for remitter, maybe it's retroactive to the date of the verdict for the ones where that was lost. Okay. But if remitter was granted, then maybe that portion doesn't begin to accrue if the remitter right. is granted because you've downwardly modified it and the, the verdict wasn't set at that date. That's right. It, that's it's right. a curious that's, point. That's, that is it. Um, so my thought right now, the answer to the question is possibly some of it between the time of the verdict and the judgment. And I can't help thinking that uh, the Lord taketh away and the Lord giveth. He took away some money from us on the remitter mm -hmm. and helped doing so, which we'll get, I'm sure we'll get into. But we still have fees, possibly interest, costs, sanctions, all sitting out there. And I don't think Howie and crew made any friends that last few days of the trial. No, and you mean filing filing a motion or filing something literally 24 to 48 hours before a holiday break? Every time? Every time. I can't, I haven't had a, I have not had a, 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 a holiday, any major holiday in five years. This is true. And I'm going to prove it in the fee hearing where they didn't inundate us with motions immediately before and try to set something up so that we would have to work over 4th of July, over Christmas, over New Year, over Thanksgiving. Yep. Those are the big ones. And, if and I, had, I, would... I wanted to go out of town to our place in Idaho, and they knew I was going to be out of town for a specific six-week or eight-week period, they would schedule everything they possibly could during that. Mm -hmm. And it, they never stopped doing it. They did it the entire trial. Everything they could possibly do to make life miserable, they did. I, and what's interesting is I've there's been a lot of comments about Hunter Carroll. I still like him. I know a lot of people were, were unimpressed. I am still impressed. And one of the things I was most impressed with throughout the trial is the work ethic of that man. Oh, yeah. I cannot mm -hmm. remember a trial where a judge took as much time in his own time, not on the bench, not during working hours, but in his own time reviewing motions, pleadings, arguments, drafting opinions, orders, and taking all the time he could to learn every facet of what was being argued. I mean, the man was, that's, was that was Herculean. It was. He was a machine. If we, if every circuit judge worked as hard as Hunter Carroll, we would never have a backlog on anything. Because I agree. That man, uh, he, I mean, his, God bless his wife and kids. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's as bad as with me and my kids and Jen. I uh, continue to be astounded at the amount of detail that went into every order. And I felt like saying, you know, judge, there is the tipsy coachman doctrine out there, you know, where if you don't put a reason down the appellate court before they can reverse you, has got to look at all possible methods of upholding you. You know, you, if you just like rule everything, but summary judgment, I mean, summary judgment, this, you know, the rule procedure says you've got to, you've got to put in your reasoning, but everything else, judge, you don't have to put in the reasons. You don't have yeah. to the gonna protect you, but the appellate he, courts, are not predictable. They are there. They are a scary people think trial is scary. Show up in front of a appellate court, make an argument and you will learn what real fear is when you, when you place it in the hands of these individuals who have a motivation or have a motivation not to hear the case. I mean, it is, it is scary. It so, is. It's still yeah. hanging out there for us. It is. Um, catching up on a few more. Matt Bond, hello, my Spiffy Legal Mumbo Jumbo Talkie Brother from Another Mother and manager of Sp Spiffy Legal Mumbo Jumbo Talkie Brother from Another Mother's Mischief. That was to you, Mischief. Uh, equality, I had a not-so-good afternoon. I needed Mr. Anderson's laugh. It's infectious. 
it it truly is. Um, here's a good one, Greg. In your long history as a lawyer, can you tell us about your biggest squirrel moment? Now, to to explain what that is, where you are on track with something, and all of a sudden, you do a squirrel and sidetrack and now you are in the never never land and wondering how you got there what's the biggest moment you can remember god and it happens to me regularly yeah. really happened to me <laughs> where was i on that point actually most people argue that i'm that way on most questions <laughs> but, but um i was in a trial it was an accounting malpractice case it was against, um, it wasn't PwC, it was, it wasn't Arthur Anderson. It was one of the big five. One of the big, big four or five? Big four or five. And I was delivering my closing and I was in the middle of a divorce. And this was a big case. And I was like living out, uh, even though uh, Ponte Vedra is only about, 30 minutes from downtown. I was still staying at a hotel and my personal life was just an absolute disaster and um, worried about my daughter and all that. So I got up and this was after a couple years before I hit some pretty big cases and because they were for a bankruptcy trustee, all of the fees awarded were published because they're public. Yep. Records. So everybody had heard how much money I had made in a couple of these cases and in one of these verdicts. So a lot of lawyers showed up to hear this guy, Anderson, in a closing against this big accounting firm. And I got up there for closing and I looked at the jurors. And they were smiling back at me and there was absolutely no reason to go blank. But I went completely blank. And... I never really look at a lot of notes as people noticed in the trial. I mean, I'll have a few there I'll glance over at, but mostly I'm off the cuff. I know what I want to say. I'm just going to get up and talk to him. And I couldn't think yep. of a thing. And I had to stop. And I said, G give me a moment, Your Honor. And I had to go back. You know, I could see people looking like, what the hell's wrong with him? And it took me a solid three or four minutes of shuffling paper. I know everybody loves me shuffling paper. Uh, to shuffle paper. Oh my God, just not next to the freaking microphones. <laughs> I know. And people but anyways, were three or four minutes. Cars. He's like, is he stoned? And um, I finally got it together and completed the the closing. And I, and I did okay, but it was extremely embarrassing because so many uh, peers were in the audience for that. So that's my biggest squirrel. <laughs> yep. On the topic of the freaking papers, I almost shipped you a stapler <laughs> in the middle of this trial because I could tell when you won a motion or lost a motion based on how that freaking stapler hit the desk. I swear to God, it, it, like it, it, the stapler was placed down, you could hear it. And I was like, okay, they won the argument. If the stapler got to do in front of the microphone and I get in treated with the deafening sound of clanking metal on would it's like well they lost that motion <laughs> i didn't even have to hear it i didn't have to hear it i just had to hear the stapler i had to hear the stapler hit the table and then i knew what was happening so i was going to send you a padded stapler yeah you know that I, that's a bad thing that those those mics stay on there's been a lot of debate about that you know the mics being always green until you press oh, I know. it yeah and i've had i've had that of course, I got a war story about everything, but I won a trial because of that one time. I and believe it. Were, You've heard some stuff captured in, in some of the cases covered by court TV that. Oh, yeah. Well, the judge is listening and counsel did not realize that those mics are live and they started to lose on, on different motions. And they were just cussing this this older judge oh, God. down right and left. And I let them do it. And they just kept doing it. And finally, the judge said, you know, I can hear every word you boys are saying. Mm -hmm. They lost horribly in that. So, yeah, I wish they would switch that around. Yeah. 
Here's a question, from JT. Why do you think the defendant never made a meaningful offer? Um, well, there's a phrase in the order that said that where the court said the court has their words the effect of the court has no doubt that Jay Hatch believed. It, it, he didn't say in his heart, but Jay Hatch believed that. Maya did not have CRPS or Maya, they did not, they believed in their bones that she did not have CRPS or something emphasizing the point that they, that's what they believed. And there's something to that. And I need help with describing the phenomena, but it is when people <laughs> enter and it happens a lot in our society now, unfortunately, people enter this world of their own creation and there's nobody there to break the narrative and they get deeper and deeper into a mythology about it and they eventually cannot absolutely cannot absorb or consider anything that's contrary to the narrative and we see that an awful lot in politics and my belief is that, well, there's two bases. The first is I think that they got themselves so wrapped up in this emotionally that they could never break it because anytime anybody said, well, maybe we should look at somebody else would shout them down or they're somehow turn the tables. That was the first reason. I definitely believe that they got caught up in their own mythology and their own belief system about how they are Johns Hopkins and they are impeccable and they never make a mistake. That was one part of it. And it's the fact well, that they've got Anthony Fauci's a little shrine to Anthony Fauci in every single elevator um, alcove tells me a little bit about that too. Here's, here's what I think you're kind of referring to. As it relates to false imprisonment claim, Jay Hatch states that with respect to the ECG room used for Jay Hatch, that room had the capability to allow ECG testing, which played no role in this case. Confusingly, Jay Hatch contends that this process was not actually treatment of Maya. It was primarily a non-invasive diagnostic test. And the problem was, it's either treatment or it's not. And you don't, when you're running up against that, where it's, I mean, the disconnect of you're arguing that it's treatment, but that it's not at the same time, you can't have both. No, you really can't. So, that Can't they see it coming with Maya's story? Come on, uh, Florida has some of the wealthiest plaintiff's attorneys for a reason. Florida juries deliver big verdicts. UF is named after Fred Levin. I expressed my opinion to you before about these institutional attorneys and how a lot of times when you go up against them, you wonder if their client was ever presented with the facts where they could make an offer of settlement that was in the hospital's best interest. I don't know that the board ever saw I speculation. I don't no. know that the board was ever consulted on half of their litigation strategy. We talked no about clue. We talked about this. My belief, my firm belief is that Howard Hunter put himself mm -hmm. in an absolutely untenable position mm -hmm. he got himself involved in the day-to-day -day operations of his client and started running the show with ethan and dictating strategy and he outsmarted himself because i know what he was doing hell i recommended that to usa swimming one time exactly what he did it's in a way, smart lawyering if you don't get too deep into it, but it is that you have them use you as a buffer so that whenever there is a controversial decision to be made, it gets run through you. So it's all attorney client privilege. And 
he did that here and he ended up slipping into running the show and all you have to do is look at his arguments in those transcripts we had done of the tapes from the last couple of hearings where Howard is arguing to send Maya to Cincinnati to live with yeah. a foster family of, that's experienced with psychiatric children to go into a psych ward all day or another place where she's a live in at a psych ward. And this is after Beata's killed herself. And he's up there arguing to send this poor kid away. There's something fundamentally wrong with that picture. And I think that Howard and that crew over there ended up believing their own BS, which is deadly, that we're untouchable. We're Hill Ward and Henderson. All plaintiff lawyers are beneath us because we squash them like bugs every time. Nobody's ever going to find out about this. So let's just go in and build a hell out of it while we manage this. And then we'll build a hell out of it while we get them out of whatever litigation, if there is litigation that goes on from the result. And so that meant that he was professionally, emotionally, and financially involved in the advice he was giving about whether they managed it well during the actual factual underlying period. A caveat to that is the advice he was reportedly giving, because I cannot fathom that the last two supplements to that motion for juror interview could have possibly Gosh. gone through anyone on the board at J hatch. I cannot fathom that there was any consultation. And I understand that lawyers have the right to dictate trial strategy and trial practice and tactics. You have the right to do that as a lawyer. That's part of your, that is, you are given that that's not malpractice to dictate discovery disputes, all the above. You can do that. That was something else. I've never seen something like that. Judgment. You're supposed to be like this with your general counsel or senior claims manager. You're supposed to be working with them. You're not supposed to be putting up walls. And before you run anything that could, before you file anything that could reflect poorly on your client, not only in the present litigation, but in other cases, I mean, the, the damage they did here with this punitive damage award and the, the things that they filed are going to stick with Johns Hopkins as an institution for decades. Oh, and on that point, you know what I can't wait for the next trial? When Jay Hatch tries to make the argument that a punitive damages award would be uh, counterproductive to medical care as a whole while simultaneously announcing the new opening of a J. Hatch hospital. in Mexico <laughs> County. Like literally they, out of both sides of their mouth, during the course of the punitive damages award, during the they course of punitive damages hurt. award, they said this is taking away treatment from cancer patients. You are taking away cancer treatment from children, and by the punitive damages award, and at the same time, they are announcing the grand opening of a brand new hospital in a different location. The deafness, the, the tone deafness of this institution is mind boggling. And it makes you wonder if anybody's even at home up in Baltimore, because I don't know, I don't know when you came in or if you ever looked at this, but most of the people involved here were not employed by Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital. Mm -hmm. They were employed by Johns Hopkins hospital systems or a very closely related subsidiary up in Baltimore. The umbrella, yeah, the big umbrella. We had every right to bring in Johns Hopkins Hospital System with its $8.9 billion net worth, but the court had not yet bought into, into our arguments, and, and really he did not... I think, trust me or even Nick 
about what we were telling him on a lot of stuff. We had such an uphill battle through a lot of those motions. And I think that this judge right now, and this is going to be particularly e interesting with the new case. Um, and don't let me forget to comment on what just happened with the police department detective uh, yesterday. Oh, yeah, but, I'll, I'll, I'll remember uh, that. Yeah. Uh, but I think if the court had it to do all over again, he would have let us go after Johns Hopkins hospital systems, the parent, because how could he not, since most of the players here were actually employees of them, as opposed to Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital. And that would have been a whole new game. Those discovery motions would have gone differently. Had huh. we done them all over again. Yep. Um, hindsight is 2020, but, is. and I wanted, so I wanted to make a point about litigation strategy and how you got here. And one of the things that I was really impressed with throughout the trial was the, the team, the camaraderie, how you had a team that felt like a team the entire way. And you mentioned taking cases at personal expense and big opposing parties who have almost innumerable funds to throw in opposition. So this case was unique in that you decided to take it. And I want to start at the end. And the result was um, a, something that looked like this. The war room. The war room. room. The room in the home that you rented in the jurisdiction to be close to the courthouse. And everyone stayed there among the binders. My word. That's one set. One set. But everyone stayed there and having everyone under the same roof throughout the entire trial, almost a, basically creating a trial family. I really admired that strategy and you could, you could see how it showed in little jokes, right? So when, when, when I would talk about Sam Lawrence and we would cheer her on during the, uh, let her introduce the characters. I can only imagine that there was little jokes and things being passed along because you were, you were a family in the same home and you were probably screaming and yelling and kicking and fighting, but also probably building a lot of bonds that were things you can't divide just by a stupid pleading. What led to that judgment call? It was... It was the experience of, well, first is it was my money. And I didn't have to worry about an insurance company telling me how much I could spend on stuff. Yep. And if I'm going to live someplace for three months, which it turned out to be, I'm not going to stay in some uh, Marriott, you know, uh, whatever those, uh, Hotel room and booking conference rooms with printers and I'm not going to do it. I just, I felt, and we actually, and, and, and Jen had rented a house that was over near the Kowalski's and it was a very nice home, but it was only about 2,800 square feet. And there were five of us and we were on top of each other and we didn't have room. And what I wanted also was someplace nice enough that people really enjoyed being there. They wanted to work there because it was just such a joy to wake up in the morning and see the Gulf out back and the gulls. And we had dolphins and we had manatees rolling around in the surf and we had kayaks we could use. The house was owned by a U.S. Senator from the Midwest, I won't say where, um, and uh, who was very nice uh, about the whole thing. Uh, and I wanted us to be a family. I wanted everyone to enjoy being there as much as possible. I knew the kind of stresses that a trial like this brings on people. And I knew that infighting among your team is a kiss of death. And so I pretty much give my people goals 
and things I need to get done and I leave them alone. I don't micromanage. I just say, I hire great people, smart people, and I train them well. And then when I need something done, I just say, I need to get this done and it gets done. But it gets done a lot easier if I'm not calling them up from the hotel down the block. Yep. And, and you know, and, and all it took was one side of me walking out in my pajamas in the morning and they were all like, oh, geez, just, you know, okay, just send me an email. Uh, but <laughs> it was that bad. But uh, it also allowed us to bring over the witnesses mm -hmm. and the experts. We had some experts stay with us. It cut down on the costs that way. Uh, it was a huge place. It was like 8,000 square feet. It slept literally 20 people. There was a bunk room downstairs. This guy had like 12 children. I'm not kidding. And <laughs> had a bunk room downstairs. We called it the bunk room. We just throw people in there. And But it was kind of like going away to camp in a way. And there was a real esprit de corps about it. And Connie was is a fantastic chef. And um, Gabby can cook as well. And, um, you know, we had always had great food delivered. We had great meals. Uh, I came home and there was a glass of wine sitting there for me. And uh, it really felt like home. And I have to say, as desperate and high stress as the situation was, every day coming home to that place, with people you were comfortable around and good things to eat and a wonderful view. It really made things not only tolerable, but almost in some ways kind of nice. It was kind of nice. Well, I miss my kids. I miss my wife, but they, you know, they came down. I got to see them, uh, but I really, if I had it to do all over again, I'd have done the exact same thing. And, and, for people that are wondering, here's I'm going to show you a quick video of how that translates to testimony elicited at trial. So be back in about mm, 80 seconds. Anything further from the claims? No, you Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> You, didn't see, you, didn't you, you don't see, understand. Yeah, the jury that. actually gets asked questions too. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice day. Plaintiffs, are there any follow-up questions? Yes, uh, Doctor. Part of your review, I'm only going to owe you one dollar. Is it a one question? One dollar. Is it a stop? Do you have a button to put and push for stop? I told you I'd pay you your dollar. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be quick, I promise. Just to follow up on one of the jurors' excellent questions. Those are the potential, yeah. Okay. I owe you $3. Oh, yeah, I know. And $4 there, $7 today. My day is done. <laughs> <laughs> he hates me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here, and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay. That was an intro I ran a while back, but those those types of things don't happen when you haven't created the environment that allows, I don't know, a trial to feel less like less like a computation of numbers and more like an actual story and a narrative. So you have to be a human being. And they take that away from us in law school. They do. They try. Yeah. They try. And it takes an awfully long time to get it back. And you and I get it, got it back. There's a lot of lawyers that don't. And one thing I tell my associates when I'm training them before some huge firm steals them, um, I say, Try to imagine when you're evaluating a case or talking to a witness or interacting in any way with a non-lawyer, try to think back and remember who you were and what you were like 
before he went to law school. Think about you in college or hell in high school or on, especially on summer breaks. Maybe you worked in a restaurant, uh, maybe you taught sailing, maybe you uh, changed transmission oil, whatever you did. Remember how you interacted in those folks? Be that person. Yeah. Be normal, everyday American. Be a good person polite, but in no way haughty or above. And you'll win people's trust and admiration. It's that simple. Yeah. On that point, BA60 asks, Robin Gregg was so pleased with the ruling of Judge Carroll, but how does a loss like this impact the defense lawyers? I can answer that one. It doesn't. They, it, it doesn't. And Greg can correct me if I'm wrong, but they have a client that they'll bill against until that client shapes up and realizes from the public that this was a bad move. They won't change. So, you know, that's a good question. And I agree with you, but I think this is unique. I, I, Interestingly enough, in February of 2023, not what, eight months before this trial, six months before this trial, I tried a case for uh, Bankers Insurance, one of my clients that I love. It's an insurance company, but, you know, they're all friends of mine, and I've been representing them for decades, and they are good people. They just try to do their job. They pay when they need to pay, and a lot of times people try to take advantage, and then, you know, I get involved, but. I tried a case for him over in Panama City, and it was a obvious loser because it was a local um, group of uh, it was anesthesiologists or radiologists, but they were very popular, very involved in the community. All the kids were in little league with everybody. Panama City is kind of a enclosed place if you've ever been there and the panhandle is very very plant oriented mm -hmm. um and i took one look at the facts and i said oh we're gonna lose <laughs> oh yeah you know i'm a damn good trial lawyer you give me any set of facts where it's even remotely even and i'll win it for you but this 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 you know but they wanted to try the case and it's a terrible feeling to walk into that courtroom and know that the, that you're going to get hammered. You're going to get hammered. I am incapable of directly lying to a jury. I cannot do it. Yeah. A few times that I've tried to misrepresent something for the benefit of client earlier in my career came up really poorly. I've learned some lawyers can do it. I can't, but don't say misrepresent, try to, to gloss the evidence in a way that just doesn't feel genuine. Yeah, we can say that, but we all know it's bullshit. Sometimes we're asked to say things and do things that we shouldn't do. I've tried to never happen. do that in my career, but, you know, shit happens. And um, I, I, I've never lied to a jury. I just try to spin it, like you said, whatever you want. How much does it, one pause here. How much does that impact how you've changed as a lawyer? Those few instances where you felt that, where you were told to do that. I imagine Horrible. it reshaped a lot. Horrifying. And, and I, and I, I fire the client and I, and I never do it again. And I never did do it again after this one instance I'm thinking of where I was forced to, it was a boat case. It was terrible, but here's the thing with insurance companies and larger, like manufacturers in particular, and I represent a lot of manufacturers. Uh, We've been counsel for Chrysler, then Daimler Chrysler, then FCA and now Stellantis for 35 years. I'm their oldest running uh, attorney in the country. And uh, I don't know whether I should be happy or sad about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I was general counsel at Chris Craft for a while and I was. Uh, trial counsel for Brunswick Boat Group, which was C-Ray and a bunch of others. But the point is I've, I've seen a lot. I've represented a lot of sophisticated people in this. And um, when you 
it doesn't, there's always a bill to pay. Okay. Somewhere, somehow, eventually, if you lose a case, it's going to, it's going to get to somebody who says, why are we using this person? Somebody that doesn't know you and there's not that relationship built in. And then your general counsel or your, your uh, senior claims manager, or your VP of, of claims, whatever is going to say, well, you know, we've been using him for a long time. He's, you know, he's won like 12 cases for us. And um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe we should broaden our horizons. Um, I had that happen to me with C-Ray. I, I won seven cases in a row and I lost two. And then I didn't see any cases for a long time. What I'm saying is that it's an extremely competitive world out there. Yep. Defense market. And it doesn't happen immediately. It's not like they're just going to walk in and say, yeah, you're fired. Go Warden Henderson. Go Warden Henderson's too plugged in politically and in the Tampa and the Bay area business and legal community for them to just say, you're out of here. Although Johns Hopkins is big enough to do it. It's doubtful they would, but, but, at some point, somebody's going to ask some questions. It's likely to be a CFO because somebody's going to have to walk in to some CEO's office for a check like this. And even though everything's been hidden, which I believe it has been up to this point, to the real serious decision makers, there's going to be a question about what the F is this? What, you know, I heard about this thing in Florida. What, what, are you, what are you talking about? We hired this firm. They're supposed to be our greatest guys. Why am I writing a check for you know, $65 million for punitive damages and other stuff? Well, what's going on here? Yep. And then, and then, and then the next call is to in-house counsel. Yeah. And then it's, it's to no, say, uh, you coordinated this. What's going on? You hired them. You told us we could trust them. Did right. you know this was going to happen? Right. What, what are you, where, what, why am I paying you? You didn't let us know that we're going to get hit with fifty million dollars. We we can't insure. What's going like, on here? Like I said, are we could have we could have written a check yesterday that that could have paid this family. We could have done that, but your failure in judgment led us here, where now it's not just a check for something. It's it's punitive damages, and it's a lot of publicity that I don't want for the hospital. And it's likely the wives. It's likely one of the senior people at Johns Hopkins or husbands. I'm not being sexist about this. I'm saying in the relationship, because there's plenty of female executives out there, probably as many as male now. My mom was one. Just as sharp and just as hard bitten when they need to be. But somebody at home or somebody that was detached a little bit from this is a better way to put it watched take care of Maya or started to follow this and started to get the real story of what was happening here. Hell, he might've been watching you and, and didn't say squat until somebody came home and said, you're never going to believe what happened today. Yeah. You're going to have to write a check for, and then somebody's going to say, Oh yeah, I've been following that for a long time. Did you know? Bang, bang, bang. Did you know? Bang, bang, bang. Did you know? Bang, bang, bang. And whoever it is is going to go, no, I didn't know those things. And they're going to go back into the office and they're going to start sending emails. Where that all ends, I can't tell you. But I can tell you that corporations are there to make money and it's very competitive. And if you are in that level, the higher stratum where you're making million dollars a year, half million dollars a year, depending on what level you're at. And you screw up and you start causing the company big money. Yep. There's about 50 people out there that'll gladly take your spot. Oh yeah. And so you won't see it immediately, but the ram I, my experience having been on the receiving end of this, my experience is it usually takes about a year or two. They let everything settle down. They let everything get paid. They get all the releases signed. They get all the rigmarole. They try to get out of the media. And then about six months later, you hear somebody got laterally transferred. And that's the last you'll hear of them. That's been my experience with execs who 
manage and listen to their either inept or for whatever reason, untruthful trial counsel and get stuck in this situation. And it's so that part is one I come back to quite a bit. So I'm sure that Jenna filled you in. I'm sure that you might have caught some of the recaps. When I approached this case, and I tried to maintain, and I did to my very best efforts, maintain neutrality and criticism of both sides, both as to you, and you and I now joke about it because they were criticisms. That's what trial attorneys do. We criticize. We we analyze everything. We're there for it. We're supposed to. But it's it's also the merits of the case, and I tried to assess those merits, and at some point in time, I reached a point in this case where the attorneys took over and the story wasn't so much. Now I want to caveat this one. This is always Maya's story. Jack's um, Jack's Kyle's be honest. It is always their story, but the trial transformed into something where the lawyers were making arguments that I was going, what the hell's happening? R really? What is happening? And I started the question saying, and they kept on saying the battery or the malpractice. And I said, so what? At this point, so what? Let me concede to Johns Hopkins every argument they're making on the CRPS diagnosis. Get me past the battery. Like, so what? Get me past that. Why can you not figure that part out? And when the lawyers couldn't, and they kept rehashing the same argument. Like, what's happening here? Why are you doing this? Like, for as many times as I wanted to punch a hole in the wall with the uh, insofar as questions, there were 9 million more times I wanted to punch a hole in the wall when the arguments for Jay Hatch were going in a direction that I said is not helpful to their entire case. The hell are you doing? And that brings me to a couple of different points. One of them was you took a whole lot of risk bringing this case on. Yeah. Personal risk, family risk, everything. And for those of you that are in the chat wondering, that room, that house that was the war room, and every lawyer in that room one of the little things about plaintiff's litigation that people don't talk about is that plaintiffs, by and large, don't have the money to fund their own litigation. And the problem with that is that defense counsel or defense does. And obviously, they have near unending pockets to fund litigation. So it takes a case to be of such significance or an attorney to care enough that they put their own firm's resources on the line or their own personal resources on the line. And they pay for the salaries of every lawyer in the room, the housing for those lawyers during trial, the transcripts, the printers, the court reporters, the experts, all of that. And that's something we talk about a little bit here, but I don't think enough. You took this case and from my, my understanding, you took this at the recommendation or the highlight from a friend, a colleague, Deborah Salisbury, an old family law practitioner like myself. How and why? So there's two parts of this question. One is the how you got involved. And I know you've done that story a little bit, a little bit more. What I want to know is. Well, I've, I've done that story before. What I want to know isn't just the how and why you got involved, but at what point when you realized the long game that Jay Hatch was willing to play, at what point did you sit down with Jen Anderson, your wife and law partner, and have a discussion saying, this is the case I want to take, and these are the resources it's going to require, and they're in it for the long game, and they're kicking this case down the road as long as it can be? And we have to do this as a family and as a law firm. Those are very, very difficult questions, even to this day. To answer the first one, the way it came about was 
you may recall that somebody tried and I think it wasn't the Pelodi case. What was it called? It began with a, it was a PE name, uh, PE Pelodi. PE. Uh, there was another attempt, a trial back about four years ago in Boston on medical kidnapping, and they lost horribly at trial. Now I can look it up, but it might have even been five years ago or more. But around that same time. One of the firms that was involved in that case, the loss, had been, some of their people had been local counsel for us in a case against Liberty Mutual that was a spinoff of the Iron 44 case. Liberty Mutual failed to pay. It was a bad faith case. We went after them. And uh, great lawyers there in Boston that we got to know, husband and wife team. And um, they got a call from Deborah Salisbury. And Debbie said, I've got this case down here. It's the worst thing you've ever heard. I know you've got a little experience in this. Um, they knew each other from somewhere before, I don't know. Can you tell me anybody who's a bulldog who'll come in and even look at something like this? It's a mess, but this was just so horrific, these facts. And um, uh, they said, yeah, we do. We're, we're actually working with them right now in this this case. And they told uh, Debbie a little bit about Iron 44. And um, that's how Debbie ended up calling me and asking me if I would get involved. And to her credit, she told me right out of the box, she said, this is the worst fact you've ever heard. And this is in an area of law that frankly, no one has ever been able to successfully conclude by trial or settlement. Chapter The chapter 39 immunity issue, navigating that. And I said, sounds perfect for me. <laughs> uh, which is a joke in a way, but it's also, you know, I had a reputation. I picked up a nickname a few years ago. Actually, it's been more than that, about a decade ago. He started calling me Honey Badger. Because my rep was when I got, once I got a hold of one of these cases, I didn't take a lot of plaintiff cases. Once I got a hold of one, I would just, you know, like a Honey Badger, I'd just keep digging and fighting until I, I got the honey. And um, then I, you know, I talked to Debbie and Jen did. Jen really believed in the case. She really believed in it. And I was like, sounds like a fight, but it didn't sound that expensive to begin with. I thought there would be a lot of legal work up early to define this chapter 39 stuff. And either we'd be out or we'd be in. Either the judge would, you know, pick up on chapter 39 and that would be it. Bye-bye. Settle it for dirt cheap. Or we'd win and then we'd progress from there. In my wildest dreams, I would say now nightmares, I never thought it would take this long, be this expensive, or be this complex. It just didn't seem like that kind of case to begin with. It seemed like the facts were pretty set, pretty horrifying. And I wasn't expecting the whole Beata recovery, all of that. I was focused more on Maya at the time and getting getting some some compensation from her for her for what she'd been through. And I remember laying in bed at night and my kids were really on. And Grayson's there snuggled up next to me and I was looking down at him and, and uh, listening to him. How old was Grayson relax. at the time? Grayson couldn't have been more than about three, maybe four. Now, he's really young. I think he was about three. And uh, you know, I was just stroking his hair and, uh, and I kept thinking, what am I going to do? What am I, what's this going to do to my kids? 
because I knew what big cases took out of you. But again, I thought this wasn't going to be that big a deal. I thought it was going to be decided on whether it was going to be a pain in the ass or not very quickly with some legal rulings. And that's my second question. That's the one I really want. Yeah. When was the moment? When did you realize it wasn't the original thought? And when did you decide that we were we were going to do this for the long haul? When we lost Maria Rule, our first judge, the way it, it got going was our first trial court was Circuit Court Judge Maria Rule. And she was fairly new on the bench, a couple, three years. And she'd run, we actually studied her, and she'd run on a platform of being four people not for the litigation process. And she wasn't coming from the state attorney's office. And I got nothing against state attorneys uh, or public defenders. They do a lot of tough work, but they don't do any civil work. And so a lot of times if they end up judges, which more and more of them are now and fewer mm -hmm. and fewer trial attorneys, they don't have the experience of running a law firm or knowing the overhead or figuring out what it's like to make these decisions. But Maria Rule did. And I remember hearing one of our first ones, we, she denied all of their motions to dismiss. She thought they were BS, which they were. And she didn't have any political leaning. She didn't seem to like Howard much. Howard was pissed that she was the judge. And, um, and then, um, we had a hearing and I got up in front of her and I said, judge, I'm not going to argue to you that this case should be tried in nine months. There's a lot to this case. So I'm not asking for early trial date, but I am asking for a definite trial date. And I asked for a trial date that was about 16 to 18 months off. And the court took that, I think, from me as, okay, this guy is for real. He knows what's involved and he wants, and I said, I want to avoid that whole thing of getting right up to trial and the defense not doing squat until the last two months before trial. And then they try to set all their depositions and trial all these motions. They file all this motion to compel. They do all this litigation. And then they come in and complain that they're out of time and it's all our fault and they need a continuance. It's crush and continue. It's paper, it's paper crush and continue. Yeah. You know it. You know it. It's a tactic. It's a. They all do it. They all do it. It's totally unethical. And they all do it, which is do nothing for a long, long time. Delay everything out. Get right up to trial. Then try to pack in every single thing you should have done over the past year or so. And then come screaming and yelling at the judge about how. Uh, persecuted you are and how it's not justice unless there's a continuance and then do the exact same thing the next time and do it again until a trial judge finally says, this is the fourth time you've come in screaming at me that you need a continuance because you couldn't get everything done. She knew that game. I think she'd experienced it because she said, no, we're not doing that here. We're going to lay out all of our pretrial requirements well, in advance, Mr. Anderson, please prepare a detailed pretrial case management plan. Work with Mr. Hunter on the times. Spread it all out so we don't ever get to this point. And Mr. Hunter, I'm not letting you do that. Don't come to me. Don't come to me for a continuance. I'm giving you all the time in the world to get all this worked out. If you don't do it, you're going to trial without it. He looked right at him and told him that. I went, Thank you, Jesus. And so it was going along fine. And that was in 2018, 2019, early part of 2020. And then two things happened. First, Judge Rule got pregnant and took maternity leave for nine months. Well, so we lost Judge Rule. The second judge that came in, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but he appeared to be a good old boy. 
And he appeared to be very tight with Howie. I didn't like that. Then COVID hit. By this point, we had personal relationships with our clients. We knew what the Kowalskis were going through. Uh, I had serious concerns about Maya. She was going to make it. I had so you were, you were at, at this point emotionally invested. I was emotionally invested with the Kowalskis. So was Jen. Even more than me, I think. And But I was looking at things backing up. And then I'm sure, I, well, I don't know what it was like in Virginia, but in Florida, they backed this stuff up for 18 months, no jury trials. Oh, yeah. They, they, we're still doing the backlog. It destroys, it destroyed litigation. It really the stupidest thing that I've ever seen in the amount of uh, individual rights that were denied because of those purely political moves is beyond belief. Well, and, and, and that's the civil rights part. Think of your friend Deborah Salisbury and the other families that had decisions that need to be made and people that couldn't make them. Kids running around yeah. wild, yeah, uh, you know, uh, spouses beating up on people, everything. Unless it was, it was really a horrible hard. time, so you'd go to send somebody to jail. But all the other stuff, you know, it was just it was it was beyond stupid. And it was really hard. It was yeah. very hard, and um, so I didn't feel like I could abandon the Kowalskis in that. But now I've got another eighteen months tacked on. So now we're looking at three years. And I'm a careful attorney, so I hired experts fairly early. Not terribly early, but after the first time I thought I was going to get a trial, I hired some experts. And the first round of them I wasn't really pleased with, and they charged me zillions of dollars, and I probably went through $350,000 of expert costs, and I wasn't pleased with them. So then uh it turned out that the judge we had at that times brother was a physician with tampa general or no uh sarasota memorial did he recuse we had to recuse him you dq'd him or recused him or he recused we asked him politely got it happy yep. To oblige. Got it. So then Judge Carroll came in, and I didn't know what to make of him. I looked at all the background. I studied all of his decisions. I looked at him. I knew he was smart as hell. I knew he wanted to be an appellate judge. It was clear. Uh, but from the very start, he did not seem particularly pleased with me or Nick or the case. And I couldn't figure it out. Can I? So at this point in time, had you had the conversation yet with with Jen and with the others in your firm about the resources that that were going to be committed to this trial? I'd had it with Jen, but understand in our firm that I was been, we've been blessed. I've been blessed with some. considerable success mm -hmm. don't and, be you don't have to be modest you you were a trial attorney that succeeded in a high risk high reward game and you had the ability through your own prior merit what you had earned what you had done for clients you had the ability to devote some resources but i don't know that it was this amount like this was a a big conversation it was a big conversation John backed me, my partner, John Glenn of Anderson Glenn, backed me. He'd been through this before with me, and he's always backed me, and he's an amazing attorney. He's kept the firm together with, with keeping the defense work rolling in when I get taken out of it to do stuff like this, and has always been with me. I had a stable platform with the firm. John trusted my judgment on stuff. We'd been through tough times before. Um I had good bankers. <laughs> they should be because I had a lot of money invested with them. You know, I'd had, I had millions invested with certain banks and in financial institutions, and they were nice enough to extend as much credit as I wanted. Unfortunately, it has to get paid back at some point. But um, I felt like 
it wouldn't bankrupt me if I lost, but it certainly would hurt badly. My lot, my lot, my lifestyle would go down tremendously if I didn't pull a rabbit out of a hat within a year or so. So leading up to the trial we were supposed to have in March of 2022. Yeah. We had a lot riding on that a hell of a lot riding on that. And I could not wait to get it to the courtroom and get it done. And what was disturbing me more than anything else through all of this was we'd already had one mediation in which they just stared at us and said, your case is worthless. We're not offering a dime. And then at the end of it, you know, they, they offered a, an absolute pittance of, uh, as part of a combined offer with Sally Smith, we ultimately settled, settled with Sally Smith and that brought in a pretty good chunk of change for the firm, which made everybody feel a little bit better. So that sort of incentivized me to keep going when we settled with Sally Smith, but, um, we still had a long way to go. And I, and Jen and I just looked at each other. And by that point, I think it was in, um, Gosh, it would have been a 2020, 21, 21 was probably 21 right around the COVID time was probably the worst. Couldn't try any cases, not much work coming in. The defense doubled down on all of their discovery. They were retaining experts. They were filing at at some points we were getting upwards of 15 motions a week. I've and, the I've seen the docket. You don't get into three thousands without. Yeah, and they were they were pulling in more and more resources, and I kind of put a stop to that, saying, "Look, just let's just not respond to this crap. We don't have to respond to a lot of it. Let's just not respond." Which was fine because then we didn't have three associates, you know, spending all their time, unbillable time, on on responses to the the the, the second rehearing of the third motion for summary judgment supplement, that kind of stuff. But it also made Judge Carroll think because he's a very you know, and and, and there are some judges who think that that. that they don't think through the fact of just how difficult it is to finance one of these things for this long. I don't know where judge Carroll came down on this. I know now he's very much obviously aware of it, but at that point, I don't know how much he was aware of it, but for whatever reason, it sent the wrong message to him because we weren't responding to a lot of stuff. So it got really, really bad. Jen and I, had so much stress on us. I was not healthy in any way, shape or form, um, for multiple reasons. And, um, uh, Jen was stressed out of her brain as you know, <laughs> rightly. So the kids were all making sense and we had an expensive lifestyle. You know, I had like, not private jets, but private turboprops, King Airs, yachts. Mm -hmm. Great plane. Like yeah. And that cost a hell of a lot of money to, to keep going. And one by one, we sold off stuff. Uh, I think at that time we had a Cruisers 40, 41. We sold that. Planes went. And then I was looking at the house and I'm going like, you know, this freaking thing's cost me 25000 a month. And, um, and, and only a little bit of that was the mortgage. And, um, so we decided to sell the house and, um, you know, it was very depressing. It was very, very depressing to lose those things. You know, the kids are looking at you like, what's going on, daddy? We're, you know, um, so it did hurt us, but by that point, I was so deeply into it and Jack knew and Maya knew what we were going through. Um, they were, they're like, we want you to have all the money. I said, no, that's not really ethical, <laughs> but, but thank you. And, um, 
I don't know. I, you know, I, to this day, I don't know how we managed to get through that to tell you the truth, Rob, I, I don't know how we managed to not get divorced or have something terrible happen, but we managed to, to keep it going. And then the trial, which we were all looking forward to got continued the day before two days, two business days before under circumstances that every lawyer I've ever run them by has said, what, what? It doesn't happen. How did that happen? And that's where I started to really freak out because you never know what you don't know. And the fact that Howie was not offering any money and didn't seem to give a shit if what the value of the case was or what the evidence was, I was looking at it like, how can you, from my standpoint, you ignore the, how can you ignore the most simple facts of what happened? Like, how can you not see like, like even the point I made, let me like, even with the conversation with Howard Hunter, if I, even if I concede to you that it was not CRPS, let's say that you win a hundred percent. That's not CRPS justify the hospital's conduct how do you value the this case where you are how are you minimizing the value of these humans the way that you are how could you not look at the fact of just all of the simple things that we do as defense lawyers in evaluating a case and not see that the kowalskis had no skeletons in the closet they were fine fine people that you know maya was beautiful and articulate and made a wonderful impression so did jack um so did kyle then he's a lot younger how can you in all of the ways that you evaluate a case and the potential exposure how can you not look at this case and go this could be a serious problem and then knowing that Howard was an experienced defense counsel, but also know, knowing he was plugged in politically, I started thinking like, what does he know that I don't? How did we end up getting continued like that? That just doesn't happen. What's going on here? And that really made it much, much worse. And then having when we conceded that we would abandon punitive damages which was the whole basis for their appeal interlocutory appeal they used to to continue the trial when we said okay we'll abandon the punitive damages you're worried about the way we pled the punitive damages we'll abandon punitive damages just get us to trial the judge is like, Judge Carroll, and I think at that point it's kind of hit him also, like, ooh, what's going on here? And we told the second DCA that, or at least we put in a memo that got at least to a clerk at the second DCA, and still they wouldn't lift the stay. That's when I started to really freak out. Because if you are willing to waive an entire segment of your case and eliminate all the issues that produces an order to stay at the last minute, what's going on? Yeah. What's, what's happening? What has kept us? Why has this not gone to trial yet? What's going on that's keeping me from trial that I don't know about? I still don't have an answer on that. But... I do know that the panel that eventually appeared for the oral argument ripped Howard a new one or the appellate lawyer. Interesting, you know, Chris Altenburn did not argue the appeal, which I found very interesting. They hired well, former chief judge of the second district court of appeal. They had got an appeal. And he didn't the, argue the appeal. Didn't argue it. Come on. What's going on there? 
There were all of these intrigues going on that one day maybe we'll find the, the truth out about. But I was just completely freaked out. And what I was thinking, and the other thing was we couldn't. Get, right yeah, me too. Right, give me two, right seconds. Yeah. two seconds. Two okay. seconds. You guys, we're going to roll. I'm going to do this because we both need a quick break. Here's a quick break because Greg had to get up and run. Quick break is Scott. Mary Murphy, yeah. member for nine months of the Can't Believe. Okay, stop, stop, stop. I need the uh, I need the Southern Febreze. Hey, can somebody bring me the raid? There's a bug. There's a bug in my studio. What in the world is that? Oh my gosh! And I don't want to uh, turn the camera on it because I'd have to zoom out so it would all fit in the camera lens. It just went behind the cabinet. It's you guys. Oh my goodness! This. There was this bug that had a huge, it's, I think it's a roach, that had a huge thing of dust on it. This, I will tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is this. That, that bug, and when I talk about bug, I'm talking, you know, it's, it's those, they call them water bugs here in the south. We know what they are, and they're not water bugs. That was, that was like, it was the size of a small dog. It looked like a this monster Rogers, coming towards me. Holy have cow. You unmute. And occasionally when we get one of these that come in the inside from outside and usually when the leaves when they fall down they're, they're around the leaves outside but when they get into the house i have uh, i have words to say and now it's it's literally it's crawling towards my green screen so i'm going to be on camera like this and then on the green screen you're going to see a bug crawl across the wall i, I can this is bad guys it's going to be a bad day i can't step on it because it's like it was like at waist level on the wall and my feet don't go that high there's a, a series of questions. Oh, I just put my arm Based in on the what dust. I heard Mr. Shapiro comment on about the 20... Bug will be dead by the end of this, this show, for sure. Bug has nowhere else to go. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like there are wires it can hide behind in here. Um, yes, cats will eat them. We've, we're keeping the cat. So welcome back. Sorry, guys. You know, you do these live streams for long enough and, and Greg is still away for a second. But I trust you that um, I'll tell you that our level of ADHD is going to be such that we'll pick right back up where we left off. What I. We'll let Greg get situated. We haven't lost Greg. Greg is still there. But, you know, every now and then individuals in long winded interviews need breaks. So from time to time, we have to take little recesses. Yes, we are human. We are human, but um, yeah. So I the matter gets the matter gets appealed. The stay is there. Judge Carroll is now getting wise to the fact that you're going. Oh my gosh! Um, I will drop everything to get this to trial. And still, still. We don't get an order back saying stay lifted. I don't know if I told you this. And maybe you can help me with with the, uh, your viewers here. But there is a term of art in appellate orders. Which says on the merits, which means mm -hmm. that the court studied the record and this isn't just a procedural thing that they've decided whether justice has been done or not. And this is their decision, kind of a final, 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 final. The first order we got on Thursday, the, I'm going to get this right here. So this is important. It was in 2023 and it was in, um, hang on, 2023 and it was in March and it would have been the 30th of March, 2023. And we were going to start picking a jury the 6th of April, but we were going to have pretrial motions. That was a Thursday. We were going to have pretrial motions, the third, fourth, and fifth, which was the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the next week. So we're starting 
the trial trial really uh we're you know that week was going to be both uh a week and a half out two weeks out we has a week out from the actual evidence it was two days it was one business day out from starting the true pre-trial voir dire stuff and we get at about 8 55 a.m we get an order and it says uh uh, petitioners, uh, petition, that's Johns Hopkins was a petitioner, petition dismissed, period, on the merits. And we didn't think anything about it because they had brought up this BS argument that, so everybody understands this, it was a highly technical argument about whether when the judge granted our ability to amend the complaint to allege punitive damages, whether we could do what we did, which was to just, as the rule says, prepare a separate piece of paper that says amendment to the complaint for punitive damages, and then just attach it to the complaint and off you go. Or whether we had to take our seventh amended complaint, we're on our seventh amended complaint. So everybody knows, usually you don't get beyond three. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, we we trial went on the eighth. Now, and so Howard's arguing, no, no, no. The rule says you've got to do an entirely new complaint. You need an eighth amended complaint, which is really important. And so the judge is saying, no, it's not. The rule says that the plaintiffs can simply file an amended amendment to their seventh. And Howard says, oh, yes, it is. It's very important. And so finally, when they were bitching so much. We just said, oh, well, screw it. Let's just file an eighth amended complaint. We filed the eighth amended complaint. They still file a petition for interlocutory appeal to the second. So when the order comes in that says, you know, kind of like, it's, it's like a block shot in the NBA, like get this shit out of here. You know, yeah. <laughs> like one of those, the, the seconds going, get this out of here. We didn't think about it. We're like, oh, yeah, all right. We didn't even think about the appeal because it was so such BS. There was no basis for it to begin with. Then we complied with what they were bitching about. So now they had no issue whatsoever. We figured they were going to voluntarily dismiss it. They never did. So the clerk of court cleaned it up and just said, get this thing out of here. And so, you know, I didn't really, I heard about, hey, that, that petition they finally got dismissed. Well, I'm fine, great. And went on to the other stuff. So, at 11.55, right before lunch, we get a second order. And the second order, and the first order was signed by a clerk. Not a judge, just a clerk, which is not unusual. Mm. Procedural stuff at the appellate courts. The second one mm -hmm. comes in and says, first order abated, further order to follow. Are you kidding me? This is at 11.55. But I still, Rob, did not freak out because I thought their petition, their appeal was such bullshit that maybe the court was going to have the Sponte award fees, right? I mean, they had no basis for doing it. Think about it. They said, you, 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 you need to file an Eighth Amendment complaint. This is really prejudicial to us. We're going to appeal you, Judge, because you won't make them file an Eighth Amendment complaint. The plaintiffs file an Eighth Amendment complaint, and they still appeal it. And let me, let me, let me translate for the chat that first order abated. That is a supervisor coming on the line saying, please hold. We will be with you in a moment. Like, right. Right. Like what the hell does this mean? But I still had faith. I still thought, you know, what? somebody at the second, finally a judge looked at this and went, this is bullshit. Why did they appeal this thing when the plaintiffs did exactly what they said they would do? What's up with this? We need to award fees on this. That's what I was thinking. One of the guys on the second, ladies on the second, took a look at this thing and said, oh, man, this is bad. We need to award fees to these, 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 these respondents. So we didn't think anything more about it. Then, again, I don't know how they timed it. At 4.55 that day, we get a third order. Remember now, the first order said on the merits. The second one to abate it also said on the merits. I don't know how you abate something on the merits, but 
The third order came in, and you really should take a look at it, Rob, because I'll be interested in your view. That's worth an entire show of analysis in and of itself. It is the most bizarre order I have ever had issue from an appellate court. It looked to me like, you know, when you hire a new associate or maybe a paralegal and they're fresh out of school and they, you ask them to prepare a draft order and they try to make it sound all lawyer-like, but they yes, get it all a lot of a lot, of big words, a lot of big words that don't make sense where they are. Exactly. And it's convoluted and, you know, it's a run on sentence and all that. That's what it was. That's what it is. It was. But the gist of it was that Judge Carroll's order denying our the, the defendant's motion to stay was now overruled. And the trial would proceed. On the merits. Okay. Three orders, seven hours apart, all three on the merits. When was the last time you saw an appellate court issue three? No, <laughs> never. With no never. change in the record. The only time they change, if it's on the merits, the only time they change that is when somebody files a new affidavit or something, you know, yeah. we just found evidence or something new. That's like a quarter. That's like a quarterback that's running back and does like three pump fakes before. Yeah, throwing it's, the ball. it's mind-bogglingly strange. And so when that happened, you saw the scene in "Take Care of Maya," where you know we 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 called up the Kowalskis. Oh, I still haven't seen it. Oh, you haven't? Oh my god! No, I I, I I I live the case. I well. I part of me is I live the case and I got to speak to the characters firsthand. And that to me is more important. You did the right thing, given what you do, not watching it. Yeah. But but I hope you do sometime because there's these, these heartfelt scenes where I'm trying to explain to these poor people. I just went what I just went through with you, I explained to them. And by this point, they're sophisticated enough legally to understand that this is just beyond bizarre. It doesn't happen. You don't shut down a case with three orders on the merits two days before it's supposed to start. Doesn't happen. Unless it's like a, um, if it's a death penalty case, those get last minute stays all the time. But like this, no way. So then that was Thursday. I had an associate have a nervous breakdown immediately after that storm out of the office then storm back almost had to call the cops because she lost it and um started saying that's things not, that's not that's not ours that's not that's not our that's not no. this associate is it no 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 that no, is not some... sam that's no not no sam. no no nobody anybody's ever heard of but well, I understand how upset she was, but she lost it completely and utterly. She's no longer with us, but everybody's really depressed. And then, um, so we talked to the Kowalskis and um, I said, well, you could drop the punitives. I said, I don't know if we can go on for another however long on this case. When we dropped the punitives. There's no reason then to to, to not to, to continue to stay the case. That's the whole issue where the pleading of punitive damages. Yeah. Yeah. Stupid issue to begin with. It was one that should have been uh, agreed to have been abandoned when we did what they asked. So mm. we filed a motion for rehearing in which we stipulated and agreed that if the stay were lifted, we would abandon punitive damages so there would be no issue whatsoever about pleading punitive damages. Oh, they didn't agree. Same clerk. Denied within an hour. Oh. The next day, we worked all day and Friday, at the end of the day, we filed an emergency motion with the Supreme Court. And I called the clerk of the Supreme Court 
you know, explain the situation a little bit, which I'm allowed to do procedurally mm -hmm. go on an emergency motion. And he said, you know, getting somebody to look at this over this weekend in the time that you need is going to be extremely difficult. I wouldn't hope, wouldn't put out much hope and sure he's shooting uh, Monday or maybe it was Tuesday morning or Monday afternoon. We got an order back from the Supreme saying insufficient emergency basis. Um, so they weren't going to take it. So we went in front of Judge Carroll and Judge Carroll is looking at all this and he's no, he knows he freaking knows he can read the orders and he knows something's really hinky with this. So he gives us those three days that we're supposed to do procedural motions and stuff. He said, look, um, I held open eight weeks. I put 2000 cases on hold or continued hearings to create this as eight weeks. I will do everything I can to get you to trial, but you've got to get relief because I am bound by what the second district tells me to do. I can't yep. just try the case. Yep. So no jurisdiction thought, can't try it. So I think actually I got it mixed up. The first one was simply a rehearing, but I think the one Monday, that was when uh, if we talk to the court, we explain what we're doing. Then I think we, we said we'll abandon punitive damages. And then within an hour, we got something back that said, no, it still stayed. And that's where I think for the first time, Judge Carroll looked at things and went, ooh, oh. he got that feeling I did. Like there's something going on that I don't know about here. But he's got to live with, with whoever that was. It wasn't a judge, I'm convinced. I don't know how they pulled it off, but they got the case continued. And this is speculation. This is 100% speculation. We are not making a factual allegation. We're speculating, Howard Hunter, just for you, speculating, positing, educational guess, however you want to phrase it, sir. <laughs> But it's, you know, Greg, this right here is what I wanted the people that are watching to view. I wanted them to see the person that I knew you were behind the mask that shows up in court. We put on... As trial lawyers, we put on the mask, the suit. We put on the face, the bravado. We are the agents of our clients. We are the shield against the swords that come that attack them. And we are the swords that attack back in defense. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we have to be the face. We have to be the voice. We have to be the posture. We have to be the person. But don't for a second think that it doesn't beat us up on the inside that we aren't conflicted and beaten down and suffering. And one of the things that people oftentimes criticize trial lawyers of being is inhuman. And it's probably the, the furthest from the truth that you could ever be. They might be the most human because they have to take all of that emotion, bottle it, process it, and bury it because they have to present for their client. and. And I have no doubt that Ethan Shapiro showed some of his humanity in his vulnerability towards the end. Now, he might have been disillusioned. And you and I had a chat about Ethan Shapiro and how we believe that he wouldn't become what I call Kool-Aid drinkers. That there was uh, there was hope for a good attorney among him, in him. And there might still be. But one of the things that we have to remember as we observe all of these trials is that the lawyers that you see on camera in court, don't ever mistake them for the humans that they are off camera with their families and in person. There are real people, real stories, real sacrifices being made and real tension. I've had those conversations with clients. Greg has. 
and someone in the chat saying we wear the mask that grins and lies hides our face and shades our eyes no we wear the mask that is the advocate for our client that is the job and it hurts more than you would ever know but you got that case to trial and the fact that you got it to trial is something that I have been phenomenally impressed with from the very beginning. From the beginning of covering this case, I have sat there and said, I don't know how this case got to trial over and over and over again. And that is a testament to the dedication from your team in getting it there. And the other part that I wanted to say was the support that you gave to someone who lived five years from the age of 12 to the, well, 13 to, to 18 in this trial. Maya Kowalski. And for those of you who think that plaintiffs are seeking a paycheck or anything like that, you have no clue what trial does to litigants. We try to have these conversations with our clients to yeah, advise yeah. them of the financial, physical, and emotional toll that trial takes on them. There are no words that could ever aptly describe the consequence that going to trial has on a, a litigant. So I know that Maya, there was mention earlier of trial tactics. And I promise you, this is the last string of topics that are tough. We'll get to fun stuff in two seconds. David Hughes and some of the trial tactics actually resulted in a rehospitalization during the proceedings, right? Yes. A very dangerous hospital proceeding admission. And to do what they did to this child is beyond humanity. They knew exactly what buttons to push with Maya. They deposed her five times. This is something where I am a bit bitter with Judge Carroll, though the first couple of times were not on his watch. And yet there's no excuse in the world for putting a 12, 13, minor, 15, 16 year old girl through two and a half to four hours of deposition with some guy on the other side leering at you and absolutely trying to destroy your in the psychological term, ego. And when they started putting those pictures of Maya up and leaving them up there, I came very, very close, probably one of the closest I've ever come to physical confrontation with, with Hughes. I, I just could not believe these are the bikini yeah. pics. And then asking about them endlessly and leaving them up there. And even after he had, quote, exhausted the subject, leaving them up there and obviously staring at them in front of her. She's fucking 15 years old. Pardon my French. No, use it. And I, I, I the stuff they did, I thought was left me speechless at times. I felt very limited in what I could do. I mean, obviously my first inclination was to just uh, say, hey, can I, can I talk to you outside? And go beat the shit up. That was my very first impulse. And that, I had multiple impulses. <laughs> wait, wait, where's, where's the, I need the photo. I need the photo. I need the photo. I need context, damn it. <laughs> no, don't do this to me, Rob. You have to be prepared. Hang on. I need context. 
This is the person he was saying, let me see you outside too. Reminder, I am six feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> Nick and I are going to have a little talk with old David. <laughs> yeah, right. these gentlemen to my right and left are going to have a chat with you. <laughs> <laughs> and we were very dedicated to pounding him into mush. But that's generally considered a faux pas in the legal practice, beating the shit out of your other, the opponent. But, you know, and I yelled at him plenty. I didn't want it to get so, they could not help. This is my big deal. They could not help themselves but turning everything personal. Yep. Everything became personal. Everything was an attack on you personally. Not about the case but about who you were and oh. how stupid you were and how dumb your motion was and how Perfect. your client was lying. And, and, and they could not say a word without turning it into something that was abusive or confrontational. And and perfect example of this is, is towards the end when uh, they throw in Miss Lawrence's husband, they reference that, that he, I don't know how they got this. I know that Miss Lawrence's husband was a medical. Are you kidding me? Really? We're better than that. We are. And, you know, the big thing I've got a problem with is that the bar before I say any, anything more, let me say that I've got a couple we don't of have to. good we friends don't have to. who were bar prosecutors pretty high up in the, in the bar prosecution process that I went to high school with both of them, as a matter of fact, and they're both retired now. They just retired one of them and the other one retired about two years ago. And we had many long late night wine fueled debates and talks at bar meetings and things about the bar cracking down on a lot of this behavior. And finally, Francine said, you know, what you don't get, Greg, is that we don't have enough prosecutors to even take care of all the shitbirds out there stealing grandma's settlement funds to go out and go after your random a-hole. And she said other terms about it. That's just acting completely inappropriately and unethically. So when you turn in somebody that's acted just so egregiously, particularly from a huge firm that's going to hire a former bar prosecutor and come in and make it a huge mess, we look at it and go, how many scumbags stealing their clients' trust funds are we going to let go to tell an asshole he's an asshole? And that was a quote, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I got it. I, I got it. I got it. I think that the bar, though, I hope maybe at some point the bar will be well enough funded to have enough prosecutors and enough people looking in on this. The big thing that I had always hoped for in this case, which Judge Carroll danced around a little bit here and there, was, you know, the, the only thing that really has an effect is where a judge refers you to the bar. I mean, Judge Carroll. A couple to the times. Yeah. yeah. When a judge sends you to the bar, then they'll sit up and take notice. If you're just Joe Schmo out there, no matter how great a Schmo you are, and you're complaining about your opposing counsel being an a hole, they're like, <laughs> news? This is news? Oh, wow. You got a defense lawyer being completely and utterly insensitive and violating about seven different four of our rules about about their behavior wow never heard that before <laughs> it's like that i'm so i don't want to i don't want to be I, you know i'm not, I'm not trying to make lies so of no but. no tom so tom, someone like tom girardi i don't know if you know the other news but tom girardi uh well-known trial plaintiff's counsel lion air case tom girardi is finally facing his comeuppance 
and it took the bar, I think, a hundred and something complaints because he paid them all off. <laughs> and and it, it's but the <laughs> funny thing is, people well, and 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 people people argue about having cameras in the courtroom and they say it's not <laughs> this is bullshit no cameras should ever be in the courtroom people shouldn't be covering trials blah 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 how the hell no. is anyone supposed to know about any of this stuff no you know what would be great is if we did have cameras in every courtroom and you had a dedicated group of folks that were somehow deputized in some form or fashion with just a basic you know, overview to make sure they're not bug ass crazy to watch hearings and trials. And if two out of the three agreed that some lawyer went way beyond the ethical and could make a recommendation to the bar based on video evidence that to three average or two out of three average citizens, this who have read the bar rules and ethics code that this is above and beyond maybe that would be like a good precursor a good um, means of identifying because then you could actually i just came up with this off the top of my head but then you could actually you know you wouldn't catch them the first time but probably after the fifth or sixth and you know you would you would identify because we're talking about maybe five percent of the practice maybe in, in 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 litigation maybe 10 five i don't know i don't know what the practice but but i mean i can tell you the law firms that i know that when i go up against them i need to be right next to my female paralegal or my female associate or or my wife because the kind of things they say and do are a danger and I say that having had my wife called an effing B in open court during a trial twice. And on both occasions, the lawyers were from, uh, well, one happened during during Iron 44 from a supposed New York silk stocking firm. The other one was from a firm in Miami, which is notorious for this kind of stuff. It's a big insurance defense firm down there. And on both occasions, when it happens, it, the kind of assholes that do this stuff don't walk up to somebody like me at six foot two and nope. say and they don't say it while i'm standing next to my wife or a female nope. paralegal they wait until i'm up there making an argument and deeply involved in something and they know to position themselves between so that there's somebody between them and the court reporter and the judge when they start saying stuff that you wouldn't freaking believe mm -hmm. and then when you complain about it particularly in South Florida, there's a lot of judges, particularly retired judges. I will never practice before a retired judge again in my life. Throw me in jail, disbar me, whatever you're going to do. I never practiced before retired judges because I've had too many bad experiences like this where I said, judge. And then, you know, four people say, judge, I heard him say, judge heard him say, court reporter, did you hear that? Oh, judge, I was covering this. Well, the court reporter didn't hear it, didn't happen. There's four people that just testified to it. You know, I'm an officer of the court. This guy in open court just called my wife this. You're not going to do anything? Well, counsel, if it's not in the record, then you, maybe you need to fill in the blank. Um, yeah, that's happened. Um, I've had a paralegal assaulted by um, a bailiff who, this is all in South Florida. Well, no, the one, one thing was in, um, was in Portland with, with this one firm from New York that was, that was defending us, de defending 
um, GE. Uh, it's always the defense firms too. You don't see this kind of behavior out of the plaintiff's counsel. You don't. I mean, they may be stealing their client's money or something like that, but you don't see this kind of behavior. It's always the senior associate, junior partner at a big insurance defense firm. Every time. In this instance, they were talking to a young, uh, really muscled up Broward County deputy who was being one of the bailiffs. He looked about 28. The guy is kind of like bulging out of his uniform. And they kept on us because it was a plaintiff case, but we weren't, we were actually kind of one of the defendants. It was a convoluted case, but they kept talking to him about how greedy we were and how society is getting ruined by stupid uh, McDonald's like claims like this. And at the end of my opening, I had a um, big board up on an easel and Kelly, who was in this trial, uh, you guys saw her a little while, uh, started to go over to take it down while the defense lawyer went up to do his thing. And the deputy or whatever he was knocked Kelly over the rail onto her head in his hurry to get over to the corner of the courtroom where our board was for my opening to take it down and make a big deal about pushing it off to the side. This is a Broward County deputy. And he got incited. He was you know, obviously dumb as a fucking rock. But, and so anybody thinks I'm anti-cop. Uh, my dad was a 30-year experienced FBI agent. He was in the Bureau for actually 32 years. And if you saw me in trial, you saw a bracelet around my, my wrist with two little badges. That's my dad's 25 and 30-year FBI badges. Mm -hmm. So... I uh, don't think for a second I'm, I'm not blue, but I've seen that kind of stuff happen in courtrooms and I just can't imagine why lawyers like that are still walking around. I can't imagine why uh, that deputy is still on the force. I can't imagine why a lot of bad shit happens, but I mean, you sort of have to say, Go in, protect your people the best you can, and get the result from your client. Well, two thoughts. One, the that kind of story. No, 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 no. What like one, the reference to the McDonald's case is a joke because if you had actually seen the injuries, third degree burns, right. uh skin grafts, several weeks in the hospital. I did a review of that case on a trials of the century. That was McDonald's PR. But two, um, there's a saying that I love, and it's one that I ascribe by in litigation because it's sometimes the only thing that gets me through the day. What doesn't get you in the wash gets you in the rinse. I love that. So, I'm writing that down with your pen. What doesn't get you in the wash will get you in, get you in the rinse. It means you're going to get your comeuppance. It might not be here, but it's going to happen. And there's going to be a day where you thought you dodged something, but it's going to come right back. So True. it's a good phrase. Yeah. Um, I'm going to catch up on some super chats, and then I want to ask you a question the chat's reminding me of. Um, Chell CD, imagine Greg Anderson adding what, if any, to his vocabulary. We're not going to teach him that. That's a terrible <laughs> phrase. What, if any. Um, Lil Mar, is there no new trial? If the family get the money, no new trial right now. It's going up on appeal if they choose to appeal it. K Rab, curious on Greg's thoughts about how important the trial became to so many people outside the parties to the point that we are still invested. Any thoughts on what it meant to the community at large? Uh, 
I operate from the belief that most Americans, no matter what brand you find them, are fundamentally good people. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is, from my experience, and I've tried, well, I've tried over 300 cases, but I, I, if you go on my website, I've documented, I think about 76 of them and really about, I call it 173 or major cases in 17 different states. So I feel like I got a pretty good idea. And I think that Americans have a very strong internal sense of justice. Mm -hmm. A pissed offedness of injustice. And I think that the take care of Maya case was a set of facts that spoke to fundamental human behavior and beliefs in the sense that, as I said and argued to the jury, you're talking about maternal instinct versus survival instinct. And most citizens, most people out there, most adults anyway, understand that concept. And I think that obviously getting the, the, the Netflix, you know, what was it? 10 million people saw mm -hmm. it. Um, that obviously helped and got the story around. But I think the trial was captivating because many, many, many people out there are cheering to see the right thing happen for once. You know, they're tired of seeing the shitbirds in our society get off with a slap on the wrist or some spin by by media or media prompts. Well, and I, I hate to cut you off, that, but but this is a question that people have asked. Maya's assault, the police won't investigate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you fill the people in on that? Yeah. You got the have, news. Yeah. Well, the news is that Detective Nicole Johnson of mm -hmm. the uh, St. Pete Police Force, without talking to me or Maya, closed the file, apparently last Friday or yesterday, has not communicated with us, just decided to close it. For those of you that don't know what happened, uh, do I need to go over it? Does most people, most people know about this, Rob? But Maya was sexually assaulted uh, while she was in Johns Hopkins that first 10 days. And Maya was able to identify exactly what the person looked like. And Maya reported it to a Johns Hopkins psychologist immediately afterwards, the psychologist Katzenstein phrased it as though it happened at another hospital. Maya then, and remember this is a 10 year old kid. Mm -hmm. Maya then reported it to one of the psychiatrists, the psychiatrist that we hired to be the independent person to help Maya, Jackie Henschke. Maya reported it again. I did not know about it when we filed the complaint or at any point up until halfway through voir dire when I was considering and ultimately did dismiss Kathy Beatty as a, a named party because I didn't party want defendant, yep. yeah defendant I didn't I didn't want them I didn't want to give them the argument that she was a rogue employee. I wanted everything focused on John Hopkins. Tactical move, but you know I talked to Maya and I said you gotta tell me every single thing that happened to you there now. Okay my like, even if you're reluctant, we've been talking about this for five years. You've got to tell me everything. And she told me a bunch of stuff that, you know, I kind of knew about, or maybe in one instance, I didn't, I didn't know completely about the dropping until, until then. But she told me about this incident where a guy walked in, in his mid thirties, uh, Maya described him specifically down to his hair color, his belt, 
his shirt and his Johns Hopkins lab coat and his stethoscope around. He opened the door. Maya was there in her underwear and pajamas. I'm, I'm telling you all this because it's already a matter of public record because we proffered this at trial. I don't, I don't reveal these things about my clients unless it's public record. And even then, so it can maybe do some good, but yeah, maybe somebody can find this guy. But anyway, he walks in, no nurse. Most people know that if you're going to examine a little girl's privates, you have multiple people. Right. And so this guy walks in alone, walks up to her and goes, can I take a peek? And then pulls down her, reaches over, of course, she's in bed, pulls the blankies down, the kid, you know, stuffed animals all around her, and takes her uh, drawstring underwear, pulls them down to her, her knees, takes her panties, pulls them down to her knees. And then Maya says that he stared at my vagina and stuff. And I haven't this is a, and stuff. Just to the chat, this is a trigger warning. These were, these just, it's a warning. I can't put it up right now, but this is stuff that makes people very uncomfortable. I'm this sorry. Is what Maya, no, it's, it's okay, Greg. I didn't, this is one of those things where it's important for people to know. And let me, let me, let me, the facts were laid out in proffer and the gentleman does that disappears. And throughout during the trial, this gets brought up, Greg brings it up as a motion to amend the complaint. And the question that Judge Carroll faces in the moment is I either have to miss trial and you can bring the whole thing again and re impanel a jury, or I don't bring it in. Impossible choice. It, it, it is. It's an impossible choice. Do you want to go back to square one and try the whole case again, knowing the resources that are going to be brought to bear when you do it? Or do you trust the justice system to file a report? and have them prosecute it to the extent that they can. And they chose the latter, which I think was ultimately the lawyer, lawyer voice, lawyer hat, lawyer hat only, lawyer hat, right choice. You have to, you got to go forward to trial. You have your jury. You've got your jury. Well, Nick Whitney, after the trial is done, goes with Maya and they file a police report. And they lay out in the affidavit all of the allegations that Greg just illustrated. And they said, these are the allegations substantiating our crime. We are within the statute of limitations for this criminal behavior. Please open investigation. And without so much as a phone call, text message, email, or notice, only after the fact did Greg learn that that was summarily dismissed. It just wasn't opened. They didn't investigate it. They chose not to. People in the chat are asking, why can they really do that? Yes and no. They can decline to investigate anything they feel they don't have the resources to investigate. However, the body politic plays a big role in that. To the extent that people are asking for an investigation, investigations will come forward. The question is, is the body politic the hospital or is it the individuals that are a member of the community? And one voice or several voices has to ring louder than others. So to the extent you live in that community and only in that community and you have a vested interest in that, you may contact to request that they reopen the investigation or they open it. They're allowed to. Nothing that stops them from doing it. But it's a it's it's a tough it's tough. And what's sad is we talk about dollar figures and people talk about these dollar figures and they're rather dismissive about the amounts of these judgments. 
what would you pay to have your child never go through that? What would you do? What wouldn't you do? I, I don't know that you can put a dollar figure on any of those things. This trial sucked. And I don't mean it from, from the litigator. I'm talking to the lawyer who tried the case. I'm talking from the person who was outside of it looking in. The, the nuances of life and law that I had to explain while watching the trial that you lived, Mr. Anderson, were more complex than anything I've ever had to explain in law before. And people were divided and emotional and invested on both sides of the aisle. My hat goes off to you for the effort that you brought forward. And honestly, for the judgment that I think the jury appropriately deemed proper and fit. And may that judgment be the beginning of healing that has been put off for far too long. Yeah. So positive note here from Matt Bond. You changed the life of so many of us CRPS sufferers worldwide. We can't thank you enough. I have questions. Mr. Anderson, thank you for giving those who aren't heard or seen a voice. The world needs more people like you. Shiraz says, the case opened my eyes to so many things, and I am a better person now for it. Laura Liani says, does Mr. Anderson have a P.O. box where we'd send him gifts to appreciation to him and his team? He has an office. Only good gifts, though. And maybe put a little glitter in the package to let them know where you're coming from. <laughs> to the poor receptionist that opens it. Also, Jay Hatch still doesn't get it. They don't. Rebus's kittens, it's 344 and negative five degrees here in the UK, but I stayed up to watch this honorable man who proves that some lawyers are good people. Tracy Collins, for Jen, you're a rock star. Hashtag wife goals. What's your marriage advice for our Rob and Miss Mischief? How do you and Greg Anderson, I imagine this is reciprocal, make it work being married and working together? Any advice, Greg? <laughs> Jen <laughs> that was a menacing laugh. I know your menacing laugh. Jen went to bed. Uh, I know. So obviously she's the smarter of the two of us, and that and, and that is really true. Jen, Jen, Jen tests up in the in the genius range, and we've all known that. Um, Jen's a full partner at our firm. Um, you know, we accept our roles. It's probably the, the biggest thing we have going for each other. Because Jen has been a trial lawyer, she knows what I go through. Because I've been a single dad, I have a little inkling of what it's like to be a mom in this situation. Understanding what an empathy is probably the thing that is most missing and most needed, not only in relationships, but in the world. It is the ability to set aside your own preconceived beliefs about how somebody is feeling, looking, doing, and trying to put yourself in, 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 the, in that brave's moccasins and walk a mile, as they say, and understanding what your spouse's reaction or response may have nothing to do with any feelings, may just be because of circumstances. So the more patience and empathy that you have for your spouse, your significant other, the more likely it is that your relationship is gonna survive. And I've also found that empathy is contagious. And when people finally find somebody who is empathetic and does put a perspective on, not from their own, but from that person's, they tend to adopt that and, 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 and pass it forward. 
So I'm a big believer in learning to step aside and step out of yourself and learn to try to look at it from the other person's standpoint. And that's what's kept Jen and I together. Thank you, sir. Wonderful advice. Um, as we wrap, Fiona W. Gifting Memberships, Row Row Gifting Memberships. Uh, you've got some kudos for your wife, JT. J Jen Anderson rocks. I choose that as my message. Um, <laughs> and then before we wrap, there are questions I know. I'm going to star them and I'm going to save them. I'll go over them on FNF. But I want to leave the chat with this parting visual. And that's this. Um, Nick Whitney sent me this picture. And he said that this was Greg Anderson prepping for a cross-examination with Pink Floyd blaring at full volume in the background in the house that was the war room. <laughs> so he's got a glass of wine, shoes off, prepping for a cross. Uh, that is lawyer life during trial. Well, aspirational lawyer life during trial. But um, I would say that these are some of the more fun images that I get to see of uh, lawyers in their element and doing what they love and fully engrossed in what they love and doing what they do for their clients. So uh, I just really wanted to share that because it was so freaking cool. Um, Chelsea, Greg, thanks for your tenacity and fighting for the family. Rob, thank you for your compassion covering the case. Thank you for both comments. Sad Tiger, such insight tonight. Thank you. Without further ado, I've got a very tired Greg Anderson here. I'm going to roll the outro and I will catch you guys in the next video. Thank you for being here. If I didn't get to your questions, please accept my apology. Um, it was a wonderful interview, three hours, longer than I thought it would be. And thank you, Greg Anderson, for spending the time with us. It, it's been a while since we were able to catch up. And hey, I'll, you know, the long... Go ahead. I'll be back. Well, I was going to say, the long-winded <laughs> conversations. <laughs> this, is, this is my payback to you. For every phone call that you gave me that was like, just be a minute, Rob. You're getting back at me. I know. I know. I'm going to have to limit it to only like, you know, 25 minutes, four times a day. <laughs> what am I going to do with all that free time? I don't know, Greg. Who knows? <laughs> you got something to do. All right. Uh, um, thank you all. Uh, Greg, hang around if you can. Uh, the outro is going to roll, and then I will catch you guys on Friday. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Cheers to all of you. May you have a wonderful rest of your week. Get some stuff done. Make January the best day ever, best month ever, and make 2024 the best year you can. I'll see you guys on Friday. Bye, guys. <laughs>